Welcome, everybody, to the Brick Yard Podcast Week 16 recap, recapping not only the games, not only the headlines, but also our Christmas spirit and all the things that went down. Our Christmas time went a little differently. You had about seven Christmases to attend to, and I <laughs> yeah, had about so. <laughs> just the one. So before we dive in, holidays, how was that? Any any good uh any yeah. Good goodies? Yeah, holidays were fun. I got this cool Lions shirt, so that's always awesome. And then a lot of food, a lot of fun. And then my friend was visiting from Michigan, so that was pretty fun. But yeah, definitely a busy time of the year. And I was kind of wiped out by the end of it, but I'm excited to be here recording. And mine was the complete opposite. I saw my <laughs> mom on Sunday, and then we got very high last uh, yesterday for Christmas. So we had a blast. It was a much different holiday than I think most people have, but it's what happens when you don't have family. So <laughs> we will continue on with our show and going through all of our uh, re- reactions to we uh, we started off with the Rams and Saints game on Thursday night, which yeah. you look at the scoreboard. You're like, oh, 30 to 22. What a great close Thursday night game. And you look at the actual game. And you're like the Saints team. I hate the Saints team <laughs> and I don't hate many teams. I am a man of love, as everyone on the show knows. Yeah. I am an optimistic man, except for when I go over the worst top five. But the Saints team. Like you look on paper, you're like, okay, we have Elvin Kamara, we have Chris Olave, we got this Jawan Johnson guy who always making plays. Defense, there's a lot of you know older players that you respect, Cam Jordan and whatnot. And then there's smudged within that Derek Carr, who they picked over Lamar Jackson. And you're like, wow. And you have Dennis Allen. That dude couldn't inspire anybody at this point. Bro, the Dennis Allen walk to the locker room, like he pointed out at halftime and he was just walking like this. He had like the flimsy wrist and he's kind of like walking like a suburban mom who's like getting out of her 1980s Cadillac about to put on a fur. And yeah. then you talk about Derek Carr, though, but you mentioned like Chris Olave being a good thing. How about that third and five where Chris Olave just dropped the ball there? So you have yeah. these situations where. Derek Carr does get some of the blame, but Derek Carr has been banged up this year. And is it completely his fault? Is it due to injuries? We don't truly know. And then this is a team that also they have like three good tight ends. Like one thing the Saints can do is draft really good corners, draft defensive linemen and draft really good tight ends. It's been nice to see Jimmy Graham getting involved the past two weeks. Kind of that ageless wonder there playing his last game in New Orleans. But you're right. This is one of those frustrating teams where they're like the Broncos. They're like the Steelers. They're like the Patriots. You just lost to Ben Roethlisberger. You just lost to Peyton Manning. You just lost to Tom Brady. And they're kind of just in this in-between where you had those really competitive rosters built around them. But now it's like, where do we go from here? And especially coaching-wise, the Patriots have Belichick. Broncos have um, John Payton. And the Steelers have Mike Tomlin. So you at least have some continuity and some hope there. But Dennis Allen, like Mr. Bedford mom walking to the locker room there, Mr. The bathroom, Mr. Know. Stepdad there, Mr. Sits down when he pees, Mr. Goes to DeWalt and then asks how to buy a drill or where to find them. He doesn't even know what he's looking for in the hardware store. Dan Campbell walks into a hardware store and he is the hardware store. That man doesn't even need any instructions on how to do it. He just walks in there and gets the job done. Yeah, so the Saints team, especially when you think about the future, when they have $84 million over the cap next year, that's going to be a nightmare to deal with. Michael Thomas, I know he's been out of the team for a little bit of time. So this team's just crumbling fast, and Derek Carr's definitely not helping them by any means. Well, let's talk about the Rams, though, because the Rams, we saw Puka Nakoa, who's on a historic pace to be, you know, best rookie wide receiver statistically. And then we have Cooper Cup doing Cooper Cup things. Matt Stafford elevating his game the last few weeks. Rams are one of the hottest teams in football. And they kind of showed that on Thursday night. 30 points again. I think this is the fifth consecutive game they've done that. Yeah. And now they're cemented into that playoff picture at that point. Yeah, this is a team that has a chance to face their division rival in the first round, the San Francisco 49ers, because we saw the 49ers line get banged up. I believe they still have another date with the Rams. So if the Rams beat them and the Lions beat the Cowboys, the Lions are still in play for the one seed there. So then this is a situation where you have Cooper Cup, who was the triple crown winner. We all know what he's about, especially in the playoff time. He's going to step it up. You have Kyron Williams, who has really electrified their run game, where Mm -hmm. earlier in the season, you really didn't have too much going for you in that department. And then you have Puka Nakua, who's also lighting the world on fire right now. And then 
and just one-on-one -on -one, Matthew Stafford trusts him. And I feel like it's right on par with the OBJ Cooper cup combination, which led them to a super bowl. So yeah. this is a team that if you're the Cowboys, if you're the lions, if you're the Eagles, you don't want to face them in the first round. So I feel like as far as a wild card team, this is going to be one of the most dangerous teams to face there. And I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of people forgot who Sean McVay is, where he just came in there after Jeff Fisher. And then Sean McVay is like, Jared Goff is broken. Nope, going to come in there, fix you. We get to a Super Bowl, trade away all of our first round picks. And then they had a really good draft this year. But offensively, he's still one of the best coaches in the league. And he's mm -hmm. showing that this 100%. season. And I feel like. As far as this year, it's probably one of his best coaching performances because no one expected anything from the Rams. We picked them to go nine and eight, so we're kind of hot and cold on them. So we put them right in that eight to ten win range, which is probably where they're going to end up. But I feel like as far as Sean McVay goes, this is probably one of his best coaching years mm. because of the lack of talent on the team. No Todd Gurley. Yeah, and I'm really impressed with what I've seen from Kyron Williams. I know he missed a couple of games, but had he had not, He'd be right there with Christian McCaffrey with some of the numbers. He was on pace. If he played a whole 17 games, he'd be on pace for 2,200 scrimmage yards, yeah. which is spectacular. And we all know how Sean McVay loves his running backs. When he gets his running back, he grinds them to the ground, which is what we saw with Todd Gurley, um, almost to his detriment. And then we see Puka Nakoa, fifth-round pick, out of nowhere. All of a sudden, he is one of the best wide receivers, statistically been the best wide receiver in the NFL at some points of the season. And then defensively, which was the biggest question for me, was how they were going to perform defensively. Because you saw Aaron Donald, but their secondary, there were some questions there. Defensive line outside of Aaron Donald, questions there. And their defense this game, I mean, I know it shows 22 points given up, but at the end of the day, fourth quarter, some junk yards that the Saints ended up getting. Yeah. But 30-7, to seven, shut them down, shut down the entire team. So really masterclass by the Rams and how Sean McVay's been. And definitely a guy that I think, you hear his name, you might be a little, you hear a lot, you hear him a lot, especially with how the coaching hires have been the last four or five years. Yeah. Maybe, you know, some fatigue there, but he is a top five head coach in the NFL and he showed that on Thursday night. Yeah. And he's a coach that actually has a Super Bowl. Kyle Shanahan, where's yours? Like out of all the young coaches, some people like to still pretend that Kyle Shanahan has proven and other coaches that haven't won a Super Bowl have proven more in this league than Sean McVay. But they haven't. And he's gotten there. He's been there and done it before. And so has Matthew Stafford. So if there's anything you don't want to face in the playoffs, it's experience because the Rams have been there and mm -hmm. done that and they know what it takes to win. So I definitely think if you face them in the first round, you're going to be on upset watch because no one wants to face this Rams team right now. How are you going to stop Cooper Cup and Pukunakua? And I feel like mm -hmm. they've come a long way since that last Dallas Cowboys matchup. Oh, yeah, 100 percent, especially with. At one point, they were three and six, yeah. and it looked like they were dead in the water, just kind of out of it, maybe looking more towards the future of next year, especially with uncertainty with uh, with Matt Stafford and what he'll be next year. And now they're in the sixth seed. We'll go over the preview in, in our uh, preview episode, but I think that this is one of those teams that, especially you pair up with a team like the Cowboys, who we saw how they were against the Dolphins this week, or the 49ers, who their offensive line's banged up. I think that they're going to be a team that gives someone living hell, and I do think they can win a playoff game. Yeah, because they're not going to be afraid of anyone, and then the moment's mm -hmm. not going to be too big for them either. Yeah. And then do you think Cooper Cup, or not Cooper Cup, do you think Puka Nakua should be the favorite for Rookie of the Year right now with CJ Stroud out? It's tough because there's so many good rookies. I think that you had CJ Stroud there. You could put Sam Laporta in that same conversation, but he's on a pace to have the best rookie season of any wide receiver. So I think that he kind of deserves to get it at that point. Yeah. You know, so I think that giving it to him, I wouldn't be upset about it, um, especially if he has 1,500 yards, 100 catches, you know, 14, whatever it might be touchdown wise. Yeah. So I think he deserves it, especially with <laughs> CJ Stroud being banged up. Yeah, that'd be pretty ridiculous there if he didn't win. But I think he could win offensive and rookie of the year. And then you could make a case for Will Anderson just with his pressure rate. But yeah, exactly. Will Anderson stepped up. But we move to the Saturday games because, as we know, we have been, especially I have been, worst top five teams for one point. The Pittsburgh Steelers, avid criticism for them, how they've played, losing to the Cardinals, losing to the Patriots. And then they step up, they face a Bengals team who is in that playoff picture, shut down Jake Browning for the second time. And then also George Pickens, which is somebody who was talked <laughs> about a lot before this game because of what happened. Last week, not blocking for Jalen Warren, 
and all the controversies that arose from that game and what happened <laughs> from there, all the criticism that he received. Yeah, I mean, George Pickens in this game, I feel like it's a similar situation to what's going on in Seattle where um, with Drew Locke, he's going to come in there and then he's going to force it to the best receiver on the field because he's a backup. He knows he's not going to be the starter there and he's probably not playing for a job. And then Mitchell Trubisky is someone who's had a lot of turnover issues, has had some issues in the past, and he really just can't force the ball. But when you have someone as brain dead as Mason Rudolph who would dare challenge Miles Garrett, because his offensive linemen were right there to back him up, but he's dumb enough to go up to Miles Garrett and then start some you know what. And then this guy's like, oh, well, I have George Pickens on the field. He's one of the most talented wide receivers in the league. Maybe, I don't know, get that guy the ball. And then every time George Pickens touched the ball, oh, wait, yeah, it's a massive gain. Four catches for 195 yards Mm -hmm. after everyone is tearing into him all week. And then George Pickens just comes out there and he's like, no. I'm going to come out here and ball out. And I've noticed whenever we put a team either on the top five, sometimes they crumble and dissolve like the Dallas Cowboys and Jacksonville Jaguars are. Or sometimes when we put the teams on the worst five, they step up and they're like, wait a minute, we're not one of the five worst teams in the league. And then they come out there firing on all cylinders. And then finally, the Steelers, I don't know, showed some life. If you guys did this earlier, you'd still be in the conversation for your division and the playoffs right now. And then this is a team that's like, if you had a competent quarterback, you could probably compete with a team like the Chiefs or the Dolphins because they are kind of, you know, they don't really beat winning teams. And then the Chiefs are starting to slide here. But could we have figured out this whole get the ball to George Pickens thing a lot earlier? Because it wasn't the run game in this game either. And then you had some defensive touchdowns. So, yeah, you have Mason Rudolph, who's not Mitchell Trubisky, not one of the worst draft busts of all time. I know he doesn't have a most valuable Nickelodeon award of all time, but he has maybe the dumbest moment in NFL history award. And then he's like, I don't know. Throw everything out the window, laser focus on George Pickens. All I need to do is get him the ball four times and he'll have almost 200 yards. Why couldn't we figure this out earlier? I just don't get it. It's an ending, but like, I don't he, get it. He gets open. It's not yeah. like he doesn't get open. He gets open on almost every play. You'll see it even if they don't give it to him. And then he gets it. He has an 86 yard touchdown, has a massive play. He's fast. He's quick. He's explosive. He's tall. He's, t- he's tall. <laughs> exactly. Big physical receiver. Like, He's got it. You can see it. It's the eye test. Look at some of the catches he's made this year, last year. He's one of the best receivers, young talents. And you think of it like, why is he not getting the ball? It's an enigma. And this is why the Steelers are easily one of the most frustrating teams for me. Because you see George Pickens. You see Deontay Johnson, Najee Harris, Jalen Warren. And they have great players on defense as well. And yet they're sometimes just so bad. But in this game... You know, they heard the noise. They watched the Brickyard podcast. They said, we are not a top five worst team, according to the Brickyard. Your documents are fudged. And they came out. They took on a Bengals team that was at one point, I believe, on the top five. I think they were on the top five last week. Yeah. And then came down to earth. It seems like the Steelers. No Jamar Chase, but. Yeah, the Steelers give them hell. We saw how Jake Browning was his first outing against the Steelers. And this time around, giving them a lot of pressure as well. So. Give a lot of credit to the Steelers here. We, we we banked on them, but we are accountable, and we know that they 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 stepped up and they could show what they're capable of. I wish yeah. they just did this every week. Do you think it's unfair, like, all the criticism, criticism that George Pickens has gotten? Because, like, how motivated... I know, like, complaining never helps, and then you should block, you should do your job and get your t- teammate open to get the touchdown there and do what's best for the team. But at the same time, when you're that otherworldly talented and George Pickens has made some of the greatest catches I have ever seen go back to last year Thursday night football versus the Cleveland Browns that one-handed catch was almost on the same level as Odell Beckham Jr and he's Mm -hmm. a guy that's proven just put it in my vicinity and I'll go 90 yards for a touchdown Mm -hmm. the game they beat the Ravens what they do Kenny Pickett audibles out and then throws it to George Pickens how much of this is on George Pickens' attitude here. How much of this is just on Mike Tomlin not being able to find a good offensive coordinator? I think there's blame on both sides. With George Pickens, the reason why I didn't care as much about him blocking, and there is an attitude there. He's definitely proved to be a bit of a diva wide receiver, as we've grown accustomed to throughout the NFL history. But at the same time, I also see George Pickens, and I know how scrawny he also looks and how skinny he looks, and him avoiding injury when he's going up against massive linebackers. I'm like, Yeah, I get it. We're at the end of the season. Maybe you want to finish out the season. So I get it. I understand on his side. And then also, 
part of this is also on Mike Tomlin, because let's not forget about Antonio Brown, Chase Claypool, Juju Smith-Schuster, the history that he's had with these wide receivers and how he handles the locker room. It's something that we've talked about it, but I also think that he doesn't get enough blame there as yeah. well for how he handles the locker room. Great head coach, no doubt about it. You know, winning season, all that stuff. But at the same time, some of this has to go on Mike Tomlin because it's been a continued issue his entire tenure as a Steelers head coach. Yeah. And then Ben Roethlisberger also went on Pat McAfee's show and he said this team has kind of killed the Steelers culture. And it kind of goes all the way back to Antonio Brown, where you did have Mike Tomlin was given a locker room that already had leaders installed there, where Ben Roethlisberger was never really the leader of that team is more yeah. Troy Polamalu, James Harrison. And then if mm -hmm. anything was going down or anyone needed to be straightened out, you already had that accountability and leader even with someone like Heath Miller, Heinz Ward was a professional. He was a diva, but he had a right to be. And it was more of a uh, Steve Smith senior type of way, yeah. not in a more TikTok social media. I want to be a rapper kind of way with Antonio Brown, Juju, Le'Veon Bell there. So do you think some of that goes back on the Mike Tomlin for not keeping up the steel curtain there and it kind of tampering down a little bit? Or do you think it's just not enough veteran leadership in the locker room? The thing is, is I see veterans in that locker room because where's like TJ Watt? I think he's one of those guys you could call a leader, whether it be an Alex Highsmith or you still have Cam Hayward in the locker room. So you have guys like that, maybe not to the out, you know, the level of Troy Polamalu and James Harrison. But at the same time, there's leaders in that locker room and it still happens to this point. And it wasn't like those some of those guys weren't there the last 10 years or so. We had Ryan Clark's in there. We had James Harrison's for a long time. And it still continues to boil over. So I do think that it's part of it is Mike Tomlin and how that culture has been built. You've seen some noise. I mean, AB doing a live stream in the locker room in the middle of him talking. Like there's <laughs> been a lot of times where you really got to tighten it up a little bit. Yeah. And we saw what happened with them against the Cardinals and Patriots and how loose they came out and how badly they performed against them. So I think Mike Tomlin does deserve some blame here. Yeah, because like following the Steelers the past few years and like following them closely, like the past decade it seems like with Mike Tomlin teams there's always the competitive spirit where they're going to come out against the best teams and then give them their best shot outside of the Patriots here but when they're going up against lesser competition it's like the Steelers under Mike Tomlin have had the kind of tendency to play down to their competition over yeah. the past few years where they're going up against a bad team and then they mess around and then you lose, you waste Ben Roethlisberger, you lose to a Blake Bortles on the playoffs where your defense can't tighten it up there Tim or Tebow. you can't stop Tim Tebow and then there's a Demarius Thomas play where you lose in overtime and then it's like, yes, sure, we mm -hmm. can blame Ben Roethlisberger for that, but can you stop Tim Tebow of all people? Like, yeah. And I get like he's a winning coach and it's like you have to look at, yeah, what's next after that? And I don't want to call for Mike Tomlin's job, but you also have to be like, you've been playing down to your competition. We gave you a Super Bowl roster. And then ever since then, we haven't been able to build a team that's even gotten close to getting back to a Super Bowl. And I felt like their roster in I want to say it was 2018 when they had Antonio Brown, Juju Smith-Schuster, Deontay Johnson was still on that team as well. They had a really good roster and I feel like They've had some Super Bowl rosters. They just haven't gotten back there. And I definitely think that part of it, I can't blame it all on Mike Tomlin, but they've had rosters that should have performed better than they did. Yeah. And they've crumbled. And not only mentioning some of the playoff losses they've had, because they've had some pretty embarrassing playoff losses, but also I definitely think this is a team that's underperformed with some of the rosters that they've had. They had who was arguably the best wide receiver of all time. You put Antonio Brown in that conversation for a period of time he was. You had Le'Veon Bell, who was one of the best running backs in football. You had, obviously, Big Ben, who's a Hall of Famer. Like, And then yeah. their defense has always been good. So I definitely think that they've underperformed the last decade, and part of that's on Mike Tomlin. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think part of it is, and then part of it, like, I feel like right now the offensive line hasn't been shored up, and then also Kenny Pickett. It's just still so bizarre to me how, like, different the Steelers team is with and without Kenny Pickett because, like, his numbers aren't that good. But when he's not on the field, they definitely play a lot worse without him. And it's just mm. something that's very bizarre. But I do think they do need another quarterback here. But get something figured out. But Steelers potentially making the playoffs. But I hope they don't make it there.
Yeah. yeah, I'm not rooting for it at all. No, do you root for them to continue that winning streak, the winning season streak? Or I just don't a- care. Who cares? Like it, most of those were like eight and eight seasons where you lost to the Marvin Lewis Bengals and you went eight and eight, and then some of those you have like you're winning the division years. Like okay, you didn't go seven and nine a single year. Congratulations. But the whole winning season nonsense. It's like. Does it really matter if you're not winning Super Bowls? Like, I guess if you want consistency Mm. and you're fine just like selling tickets and then making your revenue there. But at some point, fans are going to want more than just, oh, we didn't have a losing season. Like, that's fantastic. What do we have to show for it? Nothing. Okay, move on. Let's not waste TJ Watt's career here. Let's look at also. I mean, I don't want to compare him to Belichick, but we can because he had similar dominance where he had a winning season for you know, 17, 18 consecutive years. And what did they bring? Yeah. They were consistently 14 and two, which is better than nine and eight, I assume. And then also playoff runs after playoff runs after playoff runs, not comparing them necessarily together. But if you're talking about, you know, winning season streaks, let's also look at Belichick. Let's look at Andy Reid. Let's look at some of these, some of these other guys and what they were able to do and how yeah. they were able to achieve, ex, you know, exceed expectations. Yeah, exactly. And then Mike Tomlin, for me, he's like, Better than Sean McDermott, but he has some of those same adjustment issues on defense where I don't necessarily see him making those in-game adjustments where whenever they'd play the Patriots, they're like, oh, we're going to play zone against Tom Brady, and he's going to know exactly where to throw the ball every single time. And they would get diced up with no adjustments. And then personnel-wise, he wasn't like, hey, we need man-to-man corner guys who can cover. It's like your specialty is defense, and then your secondary year in and year out gets absolutely roasted. Yeah, so questions there with Pittsburgh. Will they move on from Mike Tomlin? Will they won't? That remains to be seen. Let's move on to the other Saturday game, which was the Chargers and Bills game. Now, before this game, I'm going to be honest with you guys. <laughs> I saw the spread. I said plus 13 for the Chargers. Should I bet on it? Because I, I know how Chargers games are. I should bet on this. And then I also know how the Bills are. And I thought to myself, Easton Stick. I can't do it. I can't do it. I didn't pull the trigger. And I regret it. Because then I also forgot how the Bills are and how they've been and how, you know, earlier this season, it was the Cowboys that the team was propping up, the media that was. And now it's the Bills. Are the Bills the hottest team, according to the NFL? Nobody wants to face the Bills. Nobody. I feel like there's some (laughs) teams who would. Now they're in the playoff race. Now they're in that competition for the AFC East. And they won. They won the game 24-22. But is it a win that I'm impressed with? Not really. What do you think about this game? Yeah, I thought this game proved when Stephon Diggs is off, when you don't have any other particular receivers on your team, you can always count on Gabe Davis. And then on the show, you've slandered Gabe Davis. You've defended players that don't block on their team like George Pickens. When all Gabe Davis has done is go out there and then he was an absolute monster in this game, willing his team to victory That's with great. Josh Allen, 165 receiving yards. Are you still willing to say that Gabe Davis is not a number two wide receiver in the NFL? Yes, I am still willing to say that. <laughs> Yes, he does have games like the four touchdown game against the Chiefs, which propelled him to superstardom amongst (laughs) the Twitterverse. And he does have games where he does have these big games. That's awesome. And this time around, he caught more than half of his passes. So (laughs) bravo, Gabe Davis. I'm happy for you. Also, where in the world is Stefan Diggs? Where is this man gone? Nine consecutive games without a thousand yards, a hundred yards. What are you doing? Um. But no, I, I I still stand by Gabe Davis not being a solid two. He hasn't had a thousand yard receiving in his entire career. And it's not that he's a bad receiver. It's like it's similar to your Christian Kirk take you had last year where you're like, probably better if there are three. Yeah. Now, Christian Kirk, I think is a little better than Gabe Davis. But Gabe Davis is is like he's he is sure. Maybe he's a two to some people. But you're telling me if they don't get another guy there who's a little bit more dynamic, that they wouldn't be that much better that they probably have the division lead right now. I think that that's, I still stand by that take. Yeah. And then ever since the 9-11 speech, as bizarre and as weird as it was from Sean McDermott, the Bills have actually kind of been on a roll here and they've actually been rally able to rally around it. So do you think the Bills um, putting themselves in the shoes of the terrorists on 9-11, like Sean McDermott advised them to do, has completely changed their season and were completely wrong about Sean Mc- uh, McDermott as a motivator here? 
All I can say is Alu Akbil. <laughs> apparently, that's what they've been going for. Um, well, when you have Josh Allen bombs and you have uh, no pun. In, well, actually, no, the pun was intended. Um, I mean, clearly it's working. I mean, now they're the sixth seed in the AFC. So, I mean, if that's what it takes, maybe they should have a Hamas speech next. Maybe that'll get them going. <laughs> yeah, you think that'll get them going? Yeah, I mean, why not, right? Or maybe you guys can go back a little further with terrorism and see what else they can rally the troops with. Yeah, see if you can rally them with some of the uh, old material from the Crusades. See if you can find an old book there from when they're marching down to the Middle East. But yeah, I think the Bills, they've kind of rallied here, but I still think the offense isn't quite good enough where they ran the ball really well last week and this week it was fine but it wasn't to the same level and then mm. Josh Allen had a fine game is 250 yards but it seemed like they just weren't too interested in the Chargers as an opponent especially with Easton Stick they're like wow this team gave up 63 points last time they walked on an NFL football field yeah what are they gonna do this time well they put up 22 points and then they were able to you know make it a close competitive game like the Chargers do but the Buffalo Bills I feel like if you want a real shot to be dominant in the playoffs, you should probably put up more than 24 points versus the San Diego Chargers or the L.A. Chargers. They should move back to San Diego, but especially a defense that was that demoralized last week where Aiden O'Connell did whatever he wanted versus you. Yeah, especially because you've seen how the Raiders offense has been. Yeah. It's not like it's fantastic. It's not like an, an offense that is spectacular, especially without Josh Jacobs the last few weeks and Devontae Adams not being utilized per, uh, per, uh, correctly. It's not like that team should have absolutely roasted you like they did. Yeah. And the Bills, who would you rather have, Aiden O'Connell or Josh Allen? Who uh, would you rather have, James Cook or Ab 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 Amir Abdullah? Because right now that's the running back for him. And then re receivers, maybe that's when you can argue. Would you rather have Devontae or Stephon Diggs? I'd take Stephon Diggs right now. Um, that team should absolutely annihilate, but they won. That's what matters. Yeah. And they move forward in the playoff picture. We'll go over the playoff picture when we preview yeah. next week. But are you still, do you believe in the bills at all? Do you think they're capable of winning a playoff game? A playoff game? Maybe it depends on who they play though. I think if they play the chiefs, potentially there may be a little bit too much PTSD, especially in the playoffs. And I think the chiefs game plan, usually Steve Spagnola steps up and that's where he really shines is in those big playoff moments. But it really depends on who they match up against. If they win the division, potentially, which I think that's what the NFL is pushing for right now. And I think if they win the division, it's just going to depend on how healthy Tyreek Hill is in that matchup when they play them. And then how well are the Dolphins going to match up versus the Baltimore Ravens there? Because if they get absolutely annihilated, I would give the Bills a puncher's chance. But you still have to beat the New England Patriots, who you lost to last time. And the mm. Patriots defense is still playing outstanding, where pick them to go on the road and win in Denver. And they were able to pretty much shut down Denver at home. And make them not do anything Denver only scored what seven points in the first half and then the Patriots were able to drop 20 on them so I think with the Buffalo Bills it's like your offense is going to be tested next week like how dynamic are you really because you're going up against a pretty good Patriots team who's been playing well have a lot of guys playing for their job so that's going to be a real test for the Buffalo Bills like are you actually going to show up versus your division rival yeah because you should and they shouldn't have lost the last time so I have faith they can beat the Patriots again, but at the same time, this isn't a yeah. team that's an easy out right now. Yeah, but with the Bills, do, can I see them competing with Cleveland and Baltimore? Absolutely not. I I just don't trust their run game enough, and I don't really their offense up points. It's gotten better since they fired um, their offensive coordinator, but at the same time, I still don't fully trust them. I can never yeah. fully trust the Bills. It's kind of like the Cowboys, honestly. Yeah, and like their new strategy is kind of like holding Josh Allen back where it's like we shouldn't be holding Josh Allen back he just shouldn't be turning the ball over non-stop it's like Patrick mm. Mahomes doesn't hold back to not turn the ball over he's still able to fling it down the field Aaron Rodgers isn't holding back it's like Josh Allen has to learn when to throw those passes and when not and it's still an evolution that he has to get used to and then do I believe in their run game? Like, still, not really. Like, I don't think James Cook is a bell cow that you can just hand the ball off to in a playoff environment in January and February, and mm -hmm. he's just going to carry you to victory in Baltimore or Cleveland. 
Well, ask me this. Do you trust Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery to be those bell cows come January? Because we pivot to our Sunday games. You have your freshly new Christmas gift in the Detroit Lions shirt. I and do. History was made on Sunday. The first division title for the Detroit Lions since 1993. 30 years in the making. Much different world than where we are today. Congrats to the Lions and... Here we are now beating the Vikings. Yeah, congratulations to the Lions. Against all odds, you went out there and did it for the first time since 1993. As Eminem said, I did it. No, wait, we did it. Still figuring out this Twitter thing. But Eminem was psyched out of his mind, Detroit legend there. I feel like the Lions probably won the first division. I mean, I feel like they hadn't won the division before he started rapping. Like maybe he was rapping, but his first album didn't come out till like 1999, right? With yep. Shady LP. That's how long it's been since the Detroit Lions have won a playoff game. They're reducing the crime rate in Detroit with these mm -hmm. wins. And then they went through a rough stretch where Jared Goff had some turnovers there. Their defense was getting cooked. Everyone started writing them off. And then the Lions came out versus the Denver Broncos, laid down the law, mm -hmm. annihilated the Saints. And then they went out there versus their division rival and the Minnesota Vikings. And then they ended up winning the division that day. They stayed mm -hmm. focused. They didn't take them lightly. They were able to turn Nick Mullins over, not once, not twice, but four times, four mm -hmm. interceptions from Nick Mullins here. And then Jameer Gibbs, as far as a receiver, has been absolutely electric out mm -hmm. of the backfield. David Montgomery has been showing why they got rid of D Swift and then went with Montgomery and then a backfield of Jameer Gibbs. Then we still have Jamison Williams, still have Sam Laporta. And then their defense is starting to sh step up and make those big plays. And then Jared Goff, everyone wanted to bury this guy. Like as soon as Jared Goff has a big, like as soon as he has like a big letdown or has a game with a couple turnovers, everyone's like, oh yeah, that's why the Rams got rid of him. That's why Jared Goff is trash. But yeah. all he does is go out there and keep pushing, keeps his head down and makes some pretty great throws there. He's a chill guy. Great quarterback. I love rooting for him. And it's like, why are people like so quick to jump on this guy? I don't get it. Yeah, people hate Jared Goff. And I don't really understand because you watch his podcast. He was on with Big Cat a couple months back. And he's a cool guy. He's an easy guy to root for. You know, SoCal kind of guy. Very laid back. And I mean, since Detroit has included Jared Goff, I mean, they had that rough season to start, you know, when they were building the roots, as Dan Campbell was saying. But since then, I mean, he's played to an elite level. He's been a good quarterback. He's been relatively good with you not know, turning the ball over. And in this game, I mean, relying on Amon Ra. Amon Ra has kind of submitted himself as one of those top elite wide receiver ones, which a lot of people had questions with entering the season. And then obviously Jameer Gibbs, he was a guy that when they drafted him eighth overall, they're like, was that the right pick? Should they have gone after someone else? Yeah. Was that the right pick there? Obviously, Jack Campbell, another guy they had questions with. Sam Laporta, another guy. So, I mean, with all the questions that they have with the Lions entering the season, are they legit? Should they be in the Super Bowl bubble? Well, you went out there. You are now still in the mix for that one seed with the 49ers going down. You have a great run game. You have a great receiving core with Amon Ra, with Josh uh, Reynolds, with Jameson Williams. Sam Laporta stepping up, their defense, their offensive line. Their defense can be spotty. It's still a young team. But overall, the Lions making their first division title. And now I think their next step in, in, in erasing that curse is going out first round, getting that playoff win, getting that off their back. Yeah, and I feel like people aren't appreciating just how historic this season is for the Detroit Lions. Like you are literally witnessing history in front of you and you want to sit there and nitpick a couple games where Jared Goff had mm -hmm. three turnovers like hello this is a team that hasn't won the division since 1993 this is a team that was mm -hmm. down in the dumpster this was a city of Detroit where crime was running rampant and then all of a sudden they've reduced the crime rate single-handedly that's how bad the Detroit Lions have been and that's how much it means for their city last year and then they started one and seven last season almost go on a run and make the playoffs. You still have people doubting them, still have people that didn't pick them to win the division yet this year. Mm -hmm. But this is a team that's gone out there and then they've proven it. And then like, sure, they're 11 and four. They're right on pace with the Cowboys who have had bad games, who have lost to the Arizona Cardinals. They're still on pace to the San Francisco 49ers who can't 
beat any team that's not the Steelers in the AFC so far this year. And then they've still gone out there week in, week out, gone up against tough competition. And then they've showed that grit. They've showed that toughness and people aren't appreciating it. But you're seeing history being created right in front of your eyes here. And then they're taking that momentum into the playoffs and in a Super Bowl bubble where if you have a home playoff game where the Cowboys have scored half as many points on the road this year. You have affiliate Philadelphia Eagles team that seems like they've lost their way since last year. You lost Shane Steichen. You lost Murph from Impractical Jokers. He's in Arizona now. And then you have a San Francisco 49ers team who lost three offensive linemen on the game in Monday night. And they're mm-hmm. now shuffling around and playing kind of offensive ring around the Rosies. We don't know if our main starters are going to be there in the playoffs, which is advantage Lions, because then Aiden Hutchinson gets to tee off on Brock Purdy. And then Brock Purdy also had a little bit of an injury scare on Monday Night Football as well. So have all those factors. And then Jared Goff has been to a Super Bowl. He's done it before. Has Mm -hmm. Dak Prescott been to a Super Bowl? Has he done it before? No. Jalen Hurts is the only other quarterback in the playoffs besides Matthew Stafford that's been there, done it, and got it done in the playoffs. Yeah. And here's context for the Lions as well. 1993. What was the different world? Well, let's see. Bill Clinton was president. That's just, this is before he was on <laughs> Epstein's list. So that's something there. We have Nirvana, who was still making music then. And Kurt Cobain was still alive. Wow. Jurassic Park had yet to be coming out. And as yeah. we know, so we're talking about a different time, different era. This is when we had way less debt on our national clock. So <laughs> much different world. Donald Trump was bankrupt at that point. Yeah, getting over things there. So much different world. The Lions are back in it. They're looking to reverse the curse. And I'm excited to be a part of the bandwagon. We were on it way earlier than everybody else. And I'm excited here. I definitely think that they can make the NFC title game. And depending on who they match up with, potentially make the whole dance. I don't think it is even depending on who they match up with at this point, because the 49ers, after watching them on Monday night, I'm like, is this really a team that's going to be three good teams in a row? I don't think so. Hmm. I mean, they've, they've been good teams to this point, but they still have a, my question with them is their offensive line. Yeah. And I definitely think that they are a team that is beatable by, yeah. by, by definite accounts. They can't be anyone from the Midwest, though. Yeah, they lost to the Vikings. They lost to the Browns. Uh, the Ravens aren't technically Midwest, but they're kind of a Midwest team kind of vibe. So if they match up with Detroit, that's going to be a really good game. And then Jared Goff is not afraid of the 49ers. And then Kyle Shanahan also has had some choking issues in the past, too. So it's like we can't fu- I can't fully embrace Kyle Shanahan, especially after some of the games and performances I've seen so far this season. Well, ask me this. Can you bank on Joe Flacco? Can I bank on Joe Flacco? Absolutely, I can bank on Joe Flacco. I mean, four games over a thousand yards, 10 touchdowns. And then Amari Cooper was like, I just want someone who can, you know, throw it past 15 yards, throw it semi accurately where I can get, I don't know, hit me in stride while I can run and then catch it after instead of having to fall down or fall any which way, not knowing where DTR needs CPR is going to throw the ball at me or where PJ Walker is going to throw the ball. So yes, I can believe in someone called Joe Flacco and Amari Cooper talking about a guy who had a career day. You yeah. started him in fantasy, probably bringing him to the finals at this point, 265 yards. I think he had 11 catches, a couple of touchdowns as well. 51 fantasy points. And Joe Flacco, the, this enigma continues. The, ba- the year of the backup quarterback, in the face of that being Joe Flacco. The Browns were a good team before Joe Flacco, but now they're a team where you look in the AFC, right? Outside of the Ravens, right? The Dolphins, we have our questions with the Dolphins. The Bills, obviously we have questions there. The Chiefs, we have questions there. The Jaguars, definite questions there. The Colts, all these teams that are in the playoff mix. And the Browns now with how great their defense has been, with how great their offensive line is, how good their run game has been. And now you have a guy who can actually get it to the good guys like Amari Cooper, like Elijah Moore, like David Njoku, three guys who have elevated their game since Joe Flacco has been there. This, you want to talk about most dangerous teams. The media will mention the Bills. Media will mention the Rams. They'll mention maybe some other team. It's it's the Browns. Yeah. It's not that hard. You look at the team. This is another team. Some of the Lions, historically terrible. We'll look at them now. Had it not been for the Ravens being as good as they are, this team would be potentially in the one seed at this point. So yeah. with Joe Flacco, if he had came a couple weeks earlier, 
this team, who knows where this team would have been? Yeah, who knows where this team would have been, but we've been consistent on the Browns this year. And as soon as I saw the hire of Jim Schwartz on that defense, I thought that was the missing piece to take the defense to the next level. And then the Rams game, you had a situation where Miles Garrett still had a bruised shoulder, so he wasn't a hundred percent there. So he's gonna be getting going towards the end of the playoffs. But you want to talk about building momentum at the right time. Joe Flacco clicking on all cylinders. And then I saw an interesting piece where it's like the NFL kind of Joe Flacco came out in the wrong time where it kind of he came out in the initial like stand in the pocket era. And then once we are in the running the passer or the quarterback running out of the pocket era with Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen, it kind of passed Joe Flacco. And then it came around full circle because you have a lot of young players in the in the NFL right now where Joe Flacco is someone who he played against Troy Polamalu twice a year. He mm-hmm. played up against Tom Brady. He's played up mm-hmm. against Peyton Manning. He's played up against Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, and Terrell Suggs in practice week in and week out. And now he's playing up against the best defense in the league in practice. You want to talk about getting yourself ready to play NFL football? Well, how about we go up against Juan Thornhill, Denzel Ward, Miles Garrett in practice every single day? And mm-hmm. then Joe Flacco going up against some of these young safeties and corners as talented as these guys are. He's like, this is not that hard. And I feel like with some of the rule adjustments, it's kind of like came full back around full circle and it's benefited Joe Flacco because he's smart enough where nothing's going to surprise him anymore. He's an older quarterback, but he came in at the end of the season and he can still throw the football down the field. But his problem before was that he held the ball too long. But now Mm -hmm. that he's older and he has kids, he doesn't want to spend the whole year rehabbing. So he's getting rid of the ball quicker. He's more accurate. And honestly, this is the best I've ever seen Joe Flacco look consistently. Yeah, he's the best he's looked all year. And this is also the best Browns team I've seen. We really do have an opportunity to see the Lions and Browns in the Super Bowl. And I think it's definitely possible with how good both teams have played. This would be an absolutely historic Super Bowl. So Joe Flacco, I like the idea of him coming full circle. Because I remember, you know, after the big Super Bowl run, him getting paid. A lot of questions whether or not he should have been paid. Is he elite? And then his career kind of faded. Lamar Jackson came in. They moved on from him. Had a couple of bouncing, you know, played for Denver, played for New York, played for a couple other teams. And then he comes back, goes to Cleveland, and here we are now. The resurgence of Joe Flacco, well documented. And it's great to see it. I think it's good for football to see yeah. a resurgence like this. And do you think this is a situation with the Lions, too, where Cleveland, I mean, you want to talk about Cleveland football? Like that is as depressing as it's gotten over the past few years. And still, it's fitting that in the year where this is the best Browns team we've ever seen, they've still gone through four quarterbacks. Like this is still mm-hmm. the most Cleveland Browns team. The best thing about this win was they weren't even running the ball that well, particularly. But Kevin Stefanski is someone who people are very like, they don't really think of him, but he did mm-hmm. win coach of the year he brought the bounce to the playoffs with baker mayfield and beat the steelers now he has a chance to go head to head with the jaguars in the first round they'll definitely be able to win there and then you're probably going to face baltimore or another wild card team in the next round potentially host a playoff game um if another wild card team maybe it's bill's Uh, Browns in the conference championship or we're going to get Ravens and Browns in the conference championship. But just talking about the Browns making a conference championship when the expectations Mm -hmm. weren't even that high coming into this year. This is also something historic that I feel like if they're in any other division, they'd be the division winner. But the Ravens just decide to have one of their best years in the past decade, the same year that the Browns have their best season. Yeah, no, it's incredible to see. And if they make the title game, It'll be the first title game that they've had since 1989. Yeah. Which they haven't made that since then. And they've never made a Super Bowl. So, I mean, we're talking about a year of breaking curses with the Lions, with the Browns. This could be a year where we actually see some some real magic happen. So I'm excited to see it. And credit to the Browns here. Joe Flacco, 368 yards, three touchdowns. Yeah. Has his fair of it, you know, of interceptions as well. But this is the best Browns team we've seen. And I'm on that bandwagon. I'm excited to see them yeah. play. Yeah, and that Texans defense, it's no slouch. No slouch. And, you know, it's unfortunate they lost. They might be out of that playoff race at this point, um, which we kind of already documented the last few weeks. But, you know, with Case Keenum, Davis Mills and whatnot, 
Um, I think they still put up a decent fight, but at the end of the day, we have the Browns, you know? Yeah, I mean, it is the Browns, and then it kind of feels like it's the Browns and Lions here. Maybe we'll get the two worst teams that have never made a Super Bowl. I picked the Jags to go to the Super Bowl who have never made it, but if it's the Browns, I'm happy with that too. I'm excited for that as well. So now we move on to the Patriots and Broncos game. Patriots, <laughs> for the first half of this game, this was one of the worst games of the year. I was ready to absolutely rip apart both of these teams. And then I blinked, and the Patriots were 24 to 7. I'm like, what just happened? I don't. <laughs> yeah. I was confused by this game. I'm like, because this game, it was 7 to 6. And Chad Ryland, horrible kicker, by the way. No offense to Chad Ryland. Um, but you see this game, right? It's 9 7. And then you blink 24 7. And then the Broncos come back, they tie the game. And then you think this game's going to overtime. And I'm like, God help us, please no. And Bailey Zappi. Marches down the field, gets into field goal range, good enough field goal range for Chad Ryland. And next thing you know, the Patriots win another game they probably shouldn't have. Yeah, the Patriots won another game. And then I was picking the Patriots to win this game. I know you didn't want to hear it. You weren't too thrilled about the Patriots pick, but I just had a feeling. I'm like, Denver coming off a loss with the Lions. Sean Payton absolutely chews out Russell Wilson after that Lions game. And then the Patriots, I'm like, I don't know with Bailey Zappi. Let me let me give it a shot. It's kind of a shot in the dark. And then they go out there and get it done. And then the Denver Broncos, everyone's like, ah, oh, Russell Wilson. He's like Joe Burrow. No, he's not. Russell Wilson is still $200 million Case Keenum. And then, like, I don't care that Russell Wilson's numbers aren't as atrocious as they were last year. I don't care that his touchdown to interception ratio, that he has more touchdowns than some of the better quarterbacks in this league so far. Like, I don't care at all because when it mattered, when you needed to go to Detroit against a reeling Lions team at the time coming off of a loss and then really lay down the law after they struggled versus the Chicago Bears, you weren't able to do that. You weren't able mm -hmm. to move the ball on them. And then versus the New England Patriots who are fighting for Caleb Williams at this point, or at least they should be. They should be trying to lose at this point because they waved the white flag. They put in Bailey Zappi. And then the Denver Broncos are like, well, that first round pick that you want, you're not going to get it this year because we absolutely suck and we may be more disappointing and worse than the Patriots are even playing so far this year because this is a team that was poised to make a playoff run. They were poised to win their division if they could just go out there and win this game because you would only be a game back from the Kansas City Chiefs, but the Denver Broncos had other things in mind and it wasn't having a nice dinner. It wasn't making sure they eat their chicken properly. They just went to KFC and shoved the entire bone down their throat and choked. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is this? Come on, Denver. This is a prime team that for somebody who does not watch football can look and be like, no, Russell Wilson, he's one of the most elite quarterbacks in the NFL. Look at the numbers. Look at this team. This team started off so bad and now they've won all these games. And then you watch the games. And you see how anemic their offense is and how they struggle to get to 20 points and how their number one receiver is Cortland Sutton. No disrespect to Cortland Sutton. He is not a number one. Jerry Judy, who Patriots fans were clamoring over, yeah. trying to get him in the trade deadline. Please, thank God they did not. <laughs> that offense, it's just such a grind to get first downs, to get points, to get field goals. This team is not good. It's not good. They're seven and eight now. Thank God they're not in the playoff race anymore. Yeah. For a period of time, I was worried that we were going to see the Broncos face off against a team like the Bills or the Dolphins or the Chiefs. And I'm like, dear God, help us. I would not. <laughs> this is a team. You want to talk about the Steelers and my issues with the Steelers? No. My <laughs> issue with the Broncos because the Broncos perform poorly. All right. Understandable. They don't have great receivers. Yeah. But when they play well. You have media heads who are like, oh, Russell Wilson's back. Russell Wilson looking like Joe Burrow, Sean Payton, all this noise. No, this team stinks. <laughs> and I'm so glad that they lost this game, even though the Patriots, they fall from two to four. And maybe they miss out on Caleb Williams, Drake May, whoever it might be. But good, because what they did, they sacrificed Caleb Williams for the sake of the Broncos not making the playoffs. So Patriots, for once. Thank you. Yeah, thank the Patriots. And finally, it wasn't an abysmal Patriots game to watch. But like you mentioned it, even the games that the Broncos have won, that Bills game where they're like, oh, my God, the Broncos are back. I'm like, are they back? Or did Josh Allen just 
hand them the game. Like, here, I don't want to win it. Here's a bunch of interceptions. Mm. You guys have fun winning this game. It's not like their offense you've ever looked and like, wow, what a great throw down the field by Russell Wilson. It's just that death by a thousand cuts offense. We can run the ball sometimes. Sometimes we can kind of pass it, but we're not particularly great at anything except mm-hmm. for defense sometimes. And sometimes, you know, we'll give up 70 points here. But this Denver mm-hmm. Broncos team, like everyone was so high on them, like, oh, don't sleep on them. This team could be the Giants the year they snuck into the playoffs. Like, you don't want to see it. Like, look at Russell Wilson's numbers compared to Eli Manning. It's like, yeah, look at the era that. Eli Manning played in if Russell Wilson's numbers are being compared to him I don't think that's really a good thing here and then you paid this guy 200 million dollars like 200 million dollars just to be average just to lose to Bailey Zappi like are you kidding me and then Patriots fans now Bailey Zappi is now a hometown hero this is getting into territory of delusion with Bailey Zappi where potentially they're like oh well should the Patriots have a real conversation about Bailey Zappi being the starter next year? And the answer is still no, <laughs> no, you've watched him play the last two years. No, please. <laughs> but what's going to happen is they're going to win one more game and they're going to be out of the race. And now they're like, oh, well, we're not going to get Jaden Daniels. We're not going to get Caleb Williams. And we're not going to get Drake Mang. Oh, well, I guess we'll rock with <laughs> Bailey Zappi. I guess we'll draft a tackle. I guess we'll draft a linebacker in the draft because that's what we need. The defense yeah. is the problem. And they're going to be the same. And then they're, Bill Belichick's going to step away. They're going to hire Wiggy, as you assume. Yeah, Wiggy. Or Gerard Mayo, which I'm not in love with as a hire personally. Yeah. And they're going to be the same old Patriots next year. Yeah. I like. I don't understand like why people are so fast to get rid of Belichick. It's like, all you need is an offense. Like, Bill Belichick has been fine. Bill Belichick is who he is, mm-hmm. and he's still one of the best defensive head coaches in the league, and the defense has played really well. Like, God mm-hmm. forbid he loses Christian Gonzalez and Matthew Judon and then is able to rebound the next few weeks, and then all of a sudden their defense is still really good without their elite. two best players. Their yeah. defense is elite the last few weeks. Yeah. They've, pl- they've been really well. So, you know, credit to them. The only thing that they can say about this season, whether they get their quarterback or not, is that they sacrificed potentially Caleb Williams to beat the Steelers and beat the Broncos. So for that, I say thank you. Yeah. Now we go on to another terrible game, which was the Commanders and Jets game. Jacoby Brissett letting it loose. Yeah, Jacoby Brissett did let it loose in this game. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to beat Trevor Simeon and the Jets. And then tough task. Brees Hall in this game pretty much had as much yards as Trevor Simeon did. He had 100 yards receiving, about 90 yards rushing in this game. He was an absolute monster. And then there are a lot of people like, oh, the Jets don't have a real running back. I'm like, really? Where's all the disrespect for Brees Hall coming from? Because most of the Jets win wins have been because of a massive Brees Hall run game. He came back versus the Buffalo Bills. The first game, he had some massive runs there. And then Brees Hall has shown that he can be one of the best running backs in the league, had about 200 total yards in this game. And then he was too much for the commanders to handle. He was too hot to handle in this game without Zach Wilson playing. No Cougar Slayer, no problem, because Brees Hall is proving he's still one of the better running backs in this league. Mm -hmm. And he's someone that's definitely been overlooked with the Jets. And this is with a bad offensive line. I don't know if it's a testament to Brees Hall as a talent or if it's a combination of the commanders just being overwhelmingly discouraged with how their season has gone so far. Yeah, I don't see that. I don't understand the hatred for Brees Hall because if you remove Brees Hall, all you have left is Garrett Wilson, which you can easily double cover. Really, that offense is really what's been that offense has just been Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall yeah. and nobody else. Because you look at this game, right? You have 16 targets for Brees Hall and 15 targets for Garrett Wilson. They threw the ball 50 times and about 60 percent of the time it was going to those two guys. And then Brees Hall picking up 95 on the ground. Brees Hall is not the problem. The problem no. is their offensive line, which has been an issue forever for the Jets. The uh, Jets have never had a good offensive line. And Trevor Simeon, like, what can you do when you're when you're when you're that guy? So uh, good for the Jets for winning a game. Uh, there was a report after this game that Robert Sala and Joe Douglas's um, will stay with the Jets next year. I agree with that. I assume yeah. you do as well. I don't think coaching has been the problem. 
It's just been the offense. But thoughts on those guys keeping their jobs? Yeah, I mean, they should keep their jobs. Um, Obviously, Robert Sala has been one of the better coaches in the NFL. The Jets are just a tough situation to go there, especially you're a New York team, but you play in East Rutherford. That's weird. And then it doesn't really attract star players to play there because like, oh, the New York Jets, that's awesome. I get to live in New York City. It's like, no, you get to live with the suburban housewives of New Jersey. And then you're like, oh, that sounds a lot less appealing um, than New York City. But I think Robert Sala, with all uh, jokes aside, has done a really good job. The fact that they were 7-10 and 10 last year, I think he's had some issues just with his press conferences and some of his confidence. But overall, the defense has not been the problem. He's done a good job at least installing a culture there with the New York Jets. So mm. his specialty is defense. That wasn't the problem. So that's a good reason to keep him. It's just like you should have kept them both, but you should have actually looked for a real solution at quarterback this year, not just Aaron Rodgers. And no, it's not because Aaron Rodgers beat the Steelers in the Super Bowl that I'm saying that. I'm saying that because Aaron Rodgers is a 40-year-old quarterback who got hurt this year, just had an Achilles injury, and that's a really tough surgery to come uh, back from. We saw the end of Kobe's career. He had the career game at the end of it, but he wasn't making too much of an impact in the playoffs. Still don't have an offensive line. Still need a one and a two at wide receiver that isn't Adam Lazard and Randall Cobb there. So, yeah. Um, Robert Sala, Joe Douglas should come back, but you really got to figure the offense out next year. And then you also have to figure out a backup quarterback next year if Aaron Rodgers isn't going to be healthy because Mm -hmm. Zach Wilson isn't the answer. Trevor Simeon isn't the answer. You could have gone out there, got someone like a Carson Wentz. I know Garner Minshew was probably going to follow Shane Steichen wherever he went. But Joe Flacco was still someone who was in your system last year. He has played with the New York Jets before, and he was sitting waiting for the phone call. You guys never reached out. Look at how good Cleveland is this year. You're telling me the Jets wouldn't be in contention for the playoffs if they didn't have Flacco? I think you're probably wrong. I think that that's been their biggest problem. It's been Zach Wilson, who we all know is not the guy. It's been Trevor Sibian. It's been it's just random quarterbacks at that time, and it's definitely been what's been the detriment for that offense. It has been their offensive line at certain points, but at the same time, you're telling me if you have a grown up there at quarterback, a guy who's proven to be a solid guy, this team would absolutely be in the playoffs. They're they're six and nine now. I think they would be at least eight and seven with a good quarterback. Yeah, they could be eight and seven for sure. I think they could be even better than that. Yeah, that's they've had some close games against some bad teams. Maybe the offensive line is a fat factor. Kevin Stefanski is a much better offensive minded head coach than Nathaniel Hackett. Um, and then they have a lot more weapons there in Cleveland, but I think they would definitely be in contention for the wild card spot. Yeah, a hundred percent. But we move on to another wild card matchup, which was the Seahawks and Titans. Seahawks stay alive. Yeah, they looked pretty dead in the water after a couple of losses in a row. Drew Locke and whatnot. They did get that win against the Eagles last week. Geno Smith returns, and they get the win against the Titans. Yeah, I mean Geno Smith returns, but is that a good thing? Yes, because he's better than Drew Locke technically, but no, because why is DK Metcalf third in targets? 11 targets for Tyler Lockett, who is 80 years old at this point. Tyler Lockett's going straight into the nursing home after he retires. And then after that, it's like, okay, then we're going to have DK Metcalf in targets. Like, no, how about rookie wide receiver Jackson Smith and Jigba? Like, okay, I guess you want to give your rookie targets. And then you have Mm -hmm. DK Metcalf there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, would you be in this game? If you targeted DK Metcalf a few times, like, yeah, probably. And then you wouldn't have had to win on another walk-off play. This is back-to-back weeks where they won on walk-off game-winning drives. And then the other team failed to get it on fourth down there versus the Eagles. And then now on the road versus the Tennessee Titans. But this isn't a team in Tennessee you should really be battling with. I feel like this is a team like, hey, can we get the ball to DK Metcalf, Geno Smith? And Mm -hmm. it's like every time Geno Smith plays, like I know he's had the issue with the interceptions and that kind of still haunts him in New York. But like DK Metcalf is so much better than Tyler Lockett and Jackson Smith and Jigba. DK Mm -hmm. Metcalf, Drew Locke showed that if you just give him a chance, like this isn't a DK problem. This is just get him the ball and throw him more targets. Dude catches the ball with one hand and then brings it under his leg. Dude catches the ball with one hand in double coverage going down the sideline here. It's like... It's not rocket science. Just get DK the ball. There should not be a week where DK Metcalf isn't number one in targets. And six targets is just not enough. When you're Mm. giving Tyler Lockett 11, 
Like, I get he's not double covered, but DK Metcalf can go up and get the ball over double coverage. That's what makes elite receivers elite. You have to get them the ball. Look at what they do with Tyreek Hill in Miami. They get him the ball. Look at what they do most of the time with Stephon Diggs. They get him the ball. Not recently, but Stephon Diggs. Justin Jefferson. Jamar Chase. Name any Cooper other. Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup. A.J. Brown. These guys here. They get the ball. Good things happen. It's the reason why they're one of the best offenses in the league. All those teams historically. D.K. Metcalf is right up there with some of these great receivers. He's big. He's physical. He's fast. He could turn. You saw what happened in the Seattle game yeah. um, the last couple of weeks. You get him the ball, he gets an 80-yard touchdown. You get him a ball, he gets a big uh, sideline catch. He's one of the most elite receivers in the game, and he doesn't get the ball. He doesn't get utilized the way he should. And part of that, I do think, is a quarterback problem, but also a scheme problem. Why are you not getting him the ball? He definitely should be getting the ball a lot more. Yeah, I think he should be getting the ball a lot more, and the game plan needs to be focused on how we get DK Metcalf the ball. I don't care if he has to do um, some of the things that D-Ball Samuel has to do where he's getting the ball out of the backfield, and then that would help your run game there. But Tyler Lockett can't be the number one guy in targets. It has Mm -hmm. to be DK week Mm -hmm. in and week out. And then if you throw a pick to DK Metcalf, I'm fine with that if you're trying to force him the ball because I know every time he touches the ball, he has a chance to take it to the end zone and make a touchdown. And I think we saw it with Drew Locke where he was fine just letting it rip to DK Metcalf. Mm. And then on those drives in Seattle versus the Philadelphia Eagles, Drew Locke was just like, okay, Close my eyes. DK Metcalf is down there somewhere. And then versus the Dallas Cowboys, Geno Smith is like, oh, let me pick apart the defense with Tyler Lockett and Jackson Smith and Jigba. And by the time he was making his read, Micah Parsons was already on him when you could just make the decision like, hey, Deron Bland has played horrible in this game. Maybe we should let DK Metcalf cook him for 300 yards instead of 200 yards. Yeah, seriously. But maybe Seattle will figure it out. They got two more weeks before the playoffs. Will they make it? Will they won't? Another team that's in the playoff hunt, two teams actually, that is the Colts and Falcons game. We saw Taylor Heineke come out of the grave. We saw him last year, what he did with Washington. They benched Desmond Miller for the second time, and now we have Taylor Heineke, and they got a big win. Taylor Heineke moving the ball well. They're getting the running game going as well. Um, Does this kill the Colts' playoff chances, or do you think they're still in the mix here? Yeah, I think the Colts are still definitely in the mix. Um, I think they're still right in the mix to win their division. Um, Jacksonville Jaguars have not looked good the past few weeks. Looks like Trevor Lawrence is banged up with injuries, and then the offense is missing Christian Kirk way too much than they should. So I think the Colts, you're going on the road to Atlanta. Atlanta doesn't really have too much to lose. You have a lot of players playing for their jobs next year, have Arthur Smith coaching for his job next year. So I think um, with the Colts, um, you're still in the mix there, and the Atlanta Falcons, were a lot more desperate for a win in this game because they're still technically not eliminated from the playoffs yet. And then Atlanta is just a different team at home, not only offensively, but I think that defense plays a lot better when they're in the dome there. So I don't think it really discourages the uh, Colts playoff hopes. Um, And I think part of it in this game, too, is they miss Michael Pittman a lot. And Mm. then he was out this game. So if he can get back healthy, I think that's going to be a lot better for their playoff chances. However, I don't really want to see the Colts in the playoffs without Michael Pittman and a fully healthy Jonathan Taylor. And then Zach Moss out again this week with the injury he suffered last Saturday night. Yeah, so the Colts have been kind of they've been derailed with a lot of these injuries. If they're not going to have three of their best offensive pieces, then really like you see them match up with a team like Miami or Buffalo or Kansas City, whoever it might be. I just I just don't see them being able to move the ball enough. And their defense has performed well, but at the same time, you want to see the best players there. It'd be funny to see Gardner Minshew kind of make the playoffs and make a run, but yeah. you just kind of know that their ceiling is limited without those three. Yeah, especially without those players. And their offense has played better. And I think with a Colts team, you have Gardner Minshew. It can be inconsistent. He did have one interception in this game, but they just weren't able to move the ball the same in Atlanta. And then they were coming off a huge win on Saturday night versus Pittsburgh. So mm. kind of looked a little bit fatigued. And I feel like this NFL season has been pretty reactionary week to week. So like offensively, I still think the Colts are sound. Still think Shane Steichen's a good coach. So as long as Michael Pittman and Zach Moss are there, wouldn't mind seeing them in that playoff spot. But if they're not going to be there, I'd like to see Cincinnati uh, take the challenge of Miami or Kansas City in the first yeah, round. I would, too. It has been very reactionary. Let's stay in the NFC South, though, because the Tampa Bay Buccaneers get a big win against the reeling Jaguars. 
blow them out 30 to 12 thoughts on this game and Baker Mayfield and the Bucks getting hot at the right time. Yeah, speaking of reactionary, so with how this NFL season has gone, Baker Mayfield's the MVP because week to week <laughs> uh, the MVP changes. So I think it has to be Baker Mayfield. And then with all jokes aside, though, this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team is coming on at the exact mm-hmm. perfect time with Tom Brady there. I'm not comparing Baker Mayfield to Tom Brady by any stretch, but it took them until about week 12, week 13. They came back from the bye. That's when they figured mm-hmm. this offense out. Mm-hmm. Todd Bowles likes to run the ball, likes playing defense. And then Baker Mayfield is like, I don't know if Rashad White and Chase Edmonds are necessarily the best backs to just give the ball to 30 times in a game. But what they are really good at is getting free in space, getting those short receptions. And then that opens up the field for Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, because now we have the threat of a receiver in Chase Edmonds and Rashad White out of the backfield. And then we have a player like Kate Otten who can come out here. And then the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense went out there and then they absolutely kicked the Jacksonville Jaguars ass. Now, is that Trevor Lawrence is hurt? I'm not sure because he had the knee injury. Now his shoulder is a little banged up here. But is that an excuse for Trevor to look like Daniel Jones? Absolutely not. Is that an excuse to have him be one of the worst quarterback statistically this season where he's a bottom 10 quarterback? No, absolutely not. No, because when we were previewing the season, we're like, okay, well, this Jags team, you have Trevor Lawrence. He is the chosen one. He has Kelvin Ridley entering the farm. We have obviously Christian Kirk. We have Evan Ingram, who had a a resurgence last year. Travis Etienne. They got Tank Bigsby and Dearness Johnson. And this Jags team has been extremely disappointing for me. And with Trevor Lawrence, he's one of those guys that I have seen him be really good. We saw him second half of that Chargers game be amazing, been amazing. There was a stretch of time last year where he played incredible. So I know he is capable, and I know he is a franchise guy, and I know that he can be a top 10 quarterback. But at the same time, when you look at the numbers there, there is a lot of questions that need to be made. You have a team like the Jaguars. I don't think the weapons are the problem. I don't think the coaching is the problem. And I don't necessarily think their offensive line has been the big problem either. But yet, their offense has been similar to the Broncos, similar to the Steelers, where sometimes they just can't move the ball. And in this game, they really struggled. I know that the Bucs defense is no joke, so I'll give credit to the Bucs there. But at the same time, four straight losses. They've basically fallen out of the race. They were one of the contenders for the first half of the season. And now at this point, with four straight losses, might not even make the playoffs at all. What are we doing here? Yeah, because I picked the Bucks in this game because I thought like momentum wise they had it on their side, but you thought the Jags could actually recapture it. Do you think any of it has to do with Trevor Lawrence? He had the knee injury, then he sprained his ankle, and now he had his shoulder injury, and then he got sacked a lot in this game. And the Jacksonville Jaguars really haven't been able to run the ball. Um, they weren't able to run it this game with Travis Etienne. Tank Bisbee has kind of not a bust, but he hasn't been panning out so far this season we'll see give him a few seasons here to pan out and then Dearness Johnson has been the bright spot there do you think Trevor's injuries play any factor in this at all with him not playing well I think it's definitely a part of it but at the same time if they're going to bring him out there and he's going to be cleared by the medical doctors to play you can't have two interceptions QBR of 64 200 yards total like I know that the injuries definitely play a part I know he's a tough kid and I know that he's a gamer but at the same time with where they are currently with losing four straight games, with having that division with the Colts breathing down their necks, they can't afford and the Texans also, they can't afford to have him play like he played on Sunday at the same time. So I think maybe we can give him some slack for those injuries, but at the same time, like you guys were seven and four, you guys were riding high, and now you guys are just continuously reeling. Yeah. And then so on Thursday night football, um, they had the wonderful graphic of not you had the meme with the two like intense dragons and there's kind of the dopey dragon on the side well with the nfc south they did four dopey dragons and then mike al michaels was roasting every team in the nfc south do you think the tampa bay buccaneers though do you think they're a product of their division and that's why they're in the playoffs or do you think legitimately they have a chance to make some noise i think they can make some noise i mean I think that they've definitely benefited from having a team like the Panthers in their division and a team like the Falcons and Saints, who all are very dysfunctional. But at the same time, like I'd put them similar in a in a a class like the 
Vikings, the Rams, three teams. Like, I think they would still be in the mix, even if they weren't leaders of their division, because you do have a good defense. You do have some nice weapons. And Baker Mayfield has brought a team to the playoffs before. So I do think they actually are a good team. And, yeah. you know, their running game has been inconsistent. That's been their big hole. But they are still a good team. I think that you could put them in that Vikings and Rams kind of category and they still be competing. Yeah. Do you think Todd Bowles should be in the conversation for um, coach of the year? The only reason why I would say no to that is because, again, you have the byproduct of the NFC South. And I also think there are other coaches who are more deserving, yeah. like a Shane Steichen, like a Dan Campbell, like a, you know, you can you can add a few other names. Kevin to the Stefanski. List. I mean, Kevin four Stefanski. quarterbacks in one year is pretty impressive to deal with. Yeah. So I think those three guys would take the edge there. But if you want to float them around, give them some props, give them some kudos, sure. Yeah, and that and then maybe John Harbaugh this year because this Ravens team has been pretty electric so far, 12-3, and three, best record in the NFL. Especially with the change that they've made with their offense like and how, how um, successful it's been, I think that deserves some credit as well. But I think Shane Steichen, Kevin Stefanski, Dan Campbell, those three should be the favorites right now. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, yeah, I think Tampa Bay, they're going to make some noise in the playoffs. So they get the Eagles or the Cowboys here looking like it's going to be the Cowboys with the Eagles proving that they can beat the Giants here. Should be a fun first round wildcard matchup. And then we have another team that had a win here, which was the Packers beating the Bryce Young led Panthers. And I'll be honest, you know, Panthers have been pretty pathetic this year and they did not get the win. But we saw Bryce Young play his best game as a pro. He yeah. had 300 yards for the first time in his career, two touchdowns, QBR of 110, and showed that he is capable. Uh, running game was not spectacular. They had a big play for DJ Chark, um, but the Packers got the win. They stay in that race. Thoughts on this game? Yeah, it's pretty crazy when you don't have one of the least inspiring coaches who failed in one organization. Then you hire him to be your offensive guru, and then you figure out that he was the exact man he was screaming that he was in Indianapolis. And then he leaves, and suddenly your offense looks good. Wow, what a change. And then Bryce Young proves that he belongs in the NFL, and I think he didn't get a fair shake. He was someone's like, he's not a bust. His best receiver is Adam Thielen. Then it's Hayden Hurst. Like, let's give this guy an actual shot. And then with those same weapons, he went out there, scored 30 points against the tough Packers defense. But for me, um, the thing that jumped off the screen was Aaron Jones returning for the Green Bay Packers. Mm -hmm. He seems like he's been the missing piece for this offense where Christian Watson has been in and out of the lineup there, but their best players on offense still is Aaron Jones. So if we have him, Luke Musgrave, a Dontavian Wicks type of player, and a few of the other ballers they have on this young team, I think he's going to be the stabilizing factor that can keep you in a game against a Dallas Cowboys or Philadelphia Eagles team that has struggled in the run defense right now. But I think defensively, it was kind of a letdown uh, as far as the Packers, because if you want to be a legit contender in the playoffs, mm. you're going to have to go up against these teams like the Lions, like the Eagles, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, even who went to Lambeau and beat you. And then like the San Francisco 49ers, it's like, I think their defense, if anything, was pretty disappointing where right. Aaron Jones was encouraging on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. You know, the Packers kind of remind me of the Texans and the AFC where it feels like you've seen elements of them this year where you know that in the future they'll be really good. Yeah. But it feels like this year isn't quite their year. I think next year they make a big move offensively. Maybe they go out and get a number one receiver or maybe they make a play on defense. But I think that those teams both remind me of a team that you've seen the flashes. You think that, you know, you have the head coach, you have the quarterback, you have some weapons that are an encouraging like a Tank Dell, like a Christian Watson or... Um, Luke Musgrave, but this year might not be their year. Do you think I'm onto something there where both teams kind of in the playoff mix, but kind of slipping out of it, and maybe yeah. next year is their year? Yeah, I think they're in a different situation because there is a lot more pressure, I feel like, on Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers this year to be good than maybe the Houston Texans, where the Texans didn't have too much pressure to be a playoff team, where mm. the Packers have a loaded roster already. You have Matt LaFleur, who needs to prove he's a really good head coach. Then you have Jordan Love, who has to prove that he's worthy of a contract here. And then he's following in the footsteps of Aaron Rodgers. So I feel like that is a good comparison, but there's definitely some different factors. But I like it. I like the comparison a lot. I think that next year, if they were to go after a T Higgins or, um, you know, yeah. maybe they go after one of the elite 
uh, wide receivers in the draft. Someone where they can get a number one truly dynamic wide receiver. Yeah. I'm excited to see how they are next year because I think they'll make that jump similar to the Texans as well. Yeah, the problem with the Packers is they really don't do too much in free agency as far as uh, receivers. However, mm-hmm. in the second round, they're very good at drafting receivers. So yeah. um, one thing about the Packers is second round receivers have kind of been their bread and butter here. So I think as long as they're going into the draft, that'll be fine, especially if you pay Jordan Love. And then I'm pretty sure they have to pay him after this season. Do you think he's going to get maybe a massive $200 million contract? Or do you think they'll be able to do something like a Derek Carr, Daniel Jones, or Jimmy Garoppolo type of deal? I hope they can give him like a Geno Smith deal where maybe you guarantee like maybe $60 million of it. Do a three-year, $100 million, Guarantee of, you know, maybe have it front-loaded. So you, have, you pay him a lot that next year. And then, yeah. you know, maybe less guaranteed. Because you're really trying to see like, kind of extend the next like two, three years, give them an opportunity, give them some security. And then if it doesn't work out next year, you can get out of that contract pretty easily. Do you think there's any teams that would try and maybe jump on Jordan Love and then say, hey, the Packers don't believe on you. They're trying to give you the same uh, amount of money as someone like Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr, um, Daniel Jones. And we know you're better than all of those guys. Maybe the Falcons, Saints step in and try and give an offer here or a quarterback needy team like maybe Tennessee if they're not in love with Will Levis or even the Giants here? Well, I definitely know that there are some desperate teams in the NFL, and if they go out and overpay for Jordan Love, which I think there are people who would, then I would see a team like Atlanta because Atlanta's in a situation where they have cap space and they can afford it, and also they have the talent around them, but maybe they can't get someone like a Jordan, you know, a Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams in the draft. Right. So that's a team. I think the Falcons are a team to circle on, especially with Justin Fields being in the mix as well. They're a team that should absolutely upgrade a quarterback and seeing someone, maybe they don't get Justin Fields. Maybe he goes elsewhere and they see, hey, maybe Jordan Love's interested. Yeah. Yeah. That would make sense because, like, I'm interested in to see, like, how Jordan Love evolves because I think he'd want to stay in Green Bay. But at the same time, like, if you have some other teams that are going to push the issue, he could probably be in a position to demand more money. Yeah. I think so too. But we will go over a couple other games here. We got the Bears and Cardinals game. My big takeaway from this game was the Bears defense stepping up the last few weeks. We've seen uh, Montez Sweat elevate his game. I thought he was good on the commanders, but I wasn't quite in love with him. I like what he's doing with the Bears, and they got things done. Justin Fields played a decent game as well, but we saw him play a good game as well. And then for the Cardinals, I mean, not much to say here. Not a lot to say about this game as a whole, but I did want to shout out that Bears defense. I think this is the team next year. If they play the right cards, I think that they could have a really solid defense next year. Yeah, not too much to say about this game, you say. Not too much. How about five targets, four catches, 107 yards, averaging 26 yards of reception for one Cole Komet, the most Komet. underrated tight end in the league right now. Cole Komet Fan has the taken the league by storm. A lot of people were saying that he's the most underrated tight end this season. While well, I was on Cole Komet last season, another thing the Brickyard brought you earlier. And then if you're a young quarterback coming out of the draft, whether it's Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, or Drake May, the number one attraction for the Chicago Bears is going to be Cole Komet there at tight end. They're like, wow. Mm-hmm. If he can do this with a guy who can't process information and is in his head and Justin Fields self-proclaimed himself, then we are going to do great things with Cole Komet here. So I think him going out there, showing that he's a dominant tight end, not just a good tight end, not just an underrated tight end, but one of the best tight ends in football. I mean, four catches, 107 yards. That is wide receiver stuff right here. Six foot six out of Notre Dame. I mean, how can you not like this guy? If you're not on board the Cole Komet train yet, well, I have bad news for you. The train has already left the station. You don't have time to get on the bandwagon anymore. And if you're going to try and catch up, you're going to be on one of those old railroad machines and you're going to have to get someone coming with you because you're going to have to be pumping it up and down to move yourself down the track to catch up to the train that's already left the station two years ago. Four catches, 107 yards for Cole Komet. All I can say is what a luxury. Cole what Komet a luxury is. is Cole Komet. Now, you know, we've talked about Justin Fields and he had an okay game, kind of hit or miss. Yeah. With a team that has the number one overall pick, 
is it kind of a guarantee now that they're going to go after one of these quarterbacks? I mean, you should because not only for just going after a quarterback, but you have NFL quality quarterbacks. This is one of the best quarterback drafts. And then Justin Fields is still not a proven commodity yet where you don't necessarily want to be in that awkward situation where you're going to talk about a contract with him. And then by the time you have that conversation next year, you're not going to have time to move on and find one of the elite quarterbacks. And then you're just going to be in a cycle. So if the Bears don't take a quarterback this year, it's going to be a massive mistake because not only could you get maybe a second or a third round pick that could help you rebuild that defense, maybe get another receiver or running back in the draft here. But if you don't have the Panthers pick next year and you don't have the number one pick in the draft, and then you're going to go out there and try and find a quarterback, which this team, the Bears, trying to find a quarterback who their best quarterback might be Justin Fields or Jay Cutler in their history. When you yeah. have an opportunity to take the next Patrick Mahomes with a lot of people in the media saying Caleb Williams there, you have opportunity to take Drake May. Um, you probably shouldn't because you don't have a great track record with drafting North Carolina quarterbacks. So I'd probably pass on him or you could take Jaden Daniels. Like I would just take him for not having to have the contract discussion with um, Justin Fields, and then you can build around the cornerstone of your franchise in one Cole Komet. You paid Montez Sweat all that money. So it's like, yeah, just go get some capital with Justin Fields. I think an offensive coach will take a chance on him. And if you don't do it this year, you're going to be like the 16th, 18th pick maybe next year. Yeah, I think it's kind of a given at this point because if you're already having questions about whether or not you want to bring in Justin Fields, it's kind of like a girlfriend that you are thinking about breaking up with, if you have to think about whether or not you want to stay with them, the answer is no. Just trade them because you can get capital for them. You could get that, continue to bolster your team, especially with a, a new head coach, most likely, with yeah. Matt Eberflus, most likely out the door. Then if you already have to ask yourself whether or not you want to keep Justin Fields, you don't want to keep Justin Fields. And I don't think that he's warranted to stay there when you have someone like Caleb Williams who has much higher potential yeah. And he's proven to be a much better passer than Caleb, uh, than Justin Fields, or it's a Jaden Daniels, or it's a Drake May. With these guys, like if you have to ask yourself whether or not Justin Fields is the guy, he's not the guy. Yeah, because you know who doesn't have to ask that question? The Chiefs, the Ravens, the Bills, whoever you want to list. You can list a bunch of other guys. If you have to ask, the answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no. And then how about this? Um, you save all that money because um, Justin Fields is gone now. And then you draft Caleb Williams. And then you go out there. Now you have the money to pay T. Higgins. Now you have T. Higgins, DJ Moore, Cole Komet. Draft a running back. We are in business, baby. That's a great offense. Yeah, and they've, they addressed the George offensive Pickens. line. They addressed the offensive line last year as well. So anything can happen. Just like anything can happen with the two teams who had not beaten a winning team. Dolphin said, hold my beer. Let me beat the Cowboys, the Cowgirls, as they are on the road, merely mustering up those 20 points and the Dolphins getting a win against the winning team. Did this game prove to you one side or the other about who if any of these two teams are legit? Yeah, it proved to me who the Dallas Cowboys are, and that's a terrible road team. They average 40 points at home, 38.9, whatever. It's close enough to 40 points I can round up. And then you have the Cowboys who average 20 points on the road. It's like when there's a 20 point difference between your at home and on the road, like scoring, that is a huge problem, especially mm -hmm. for the Dallas Cowboys. And then this was a two point game. I picked the Miami Dolphins in this game. You picked the Cowboys, but it was really kind of a toss up. It's like, the Cowboys beat the Eagles, but they normally split with them. But other than that, they really haven't had too many impressive wins so far. And then you lose on the road to the Buffalo Bills, go down to Miami, and now it's two straight losses since I put you on the top five. Let me talk about teams who you put them on the bottom five, and then they rise up, and then sometimes I'll put the Jaguars on the top five. Ever since then, they've lost four straight. And then ever since I put the Dallas Cowboys and made the mistake of putting them on the top five, they've lost two straight games. So I've learned my lesson that the Dallas Cowboys are not a top five team. If they go into the playoffs and they have to play on the road, God forbid that the Cowboys tell you who they are and you don't believe them. It's like, okay, if the Cowboys are telling me that they're going to average 20 points on the road. All right. I, I believe you. You're a bad road team. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the, the numbers between it are so drastic. If they're not playing at Jerry world, they yeah. are an average team at best. And 
And when they play at home, they are the Super Bowl favorites. Yeah. There should not be because there are plenty of teams who are genuinely legit teams that will be in the top five teams where it does not matter where they play because it's the same product wherever you go. It's like Duncan. It's like Starbucks. Scary for me. Yeah. Because you should be a consistent team no matter where you go. The fact that you're a world beater at home and an average team at best away scares me. So this is a team we believed in them. This year felt different, but it's the same old Cowboys. It's the same team we've seen the last 30 years. Unlike the Lions who are turning back the clock and changing yeah. the narrative. Unlike the Browns, the Cowboys stay the same. Yeah, and I gave the Cowboys one shot. I'm like, all right, I'm going to put them on the top five this week. You beat the Philadelphia Eagles, the defending Super Bowl um, appearances in after they won the NFC. Defending NFC champs, they get to the Super Bowl there. And I was like, all right, you beat the Eagles. I'll put you number two. And then ever since then, they're like, oh, absolutely not. And the thing is, CeeDee Lamb had a good game. Mm -hmm. It's like CD Lamb wasn't that bad in this game. And then this very interesting that we have this huge controversy that Cam Newton's like, yeah, Brock Purdy, Jared Goff, Dak Prescott, all of these guys are game managers. They're not going to go out there and win you the game. They're not going to go out there and lose you the game either. And I'm not saying they're bad quarterbacks, but it's like they're not going to lose you the game, but they're not going to win you the game. Well, what does Dak Prescott do? Has about 250 passing yards, no interceptions in this game. It's like, okay, well, did he lose them the game? Technically not, but did he go out there and make enough plays to win you the game? Absolutely not. And this is why, like, people were like, how could you put Brock Purdy in the MVP conversation? Well, it's like, you should have the exact same energy about Dak Prescott because mm -hmm. not only is Brock Purdy getting paid $400,000, which is valuable on its own and warrants him being in the MVP conversation. Dak Prescott is getting paid 40 to 70 million, depending on the given year. How is that valuable when mm -hmm. you could really use a, I don't know, an Amari Cooper next to CeeDee Lamb? Oh, why can't we pay him? Oh, right, because we're paying Dak Prescott. And then he just got a 265 receiving yards of this week. You're mm -hmm. telling me they wouldn't have had a better shot in Miami or in Buffalo or in Arizona or in San Francisco if you had Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb? It's like, no, absolutely not. So it's like Cam Newton's point is very valid after this game with Dak Prescott. And Dak Prescott literally proved his point because he didn't win the game and he didn't lose the game. This game also really reminded me of the 49ers games the last two years where yeah. the first three quarters, it looks like they're dead at certain points. They scored a touchdown to start the game. And then the next two quarters, they proceed to do nothing on offense. Yeah, They go down 19 to 10. And then the fourth quarter comes alive and fourth quarter Dak they go out, they get the lead, and then obviously they lose in the last few seconds. But this game to me felt like those 49ers games where, you know, they're like, they just don't feel motivated. They don't feel encouraged. I don't know what it was. Maybe it's because, you know, Jerry World wasn't there. Maybe they weren't in Arlington. But it just felt like they didn't have the dog in them the yeah. first three quarters. And then finally, they nearly win the game and then, you know, whatnot. But at the same time, this team, I just... I can't get over how different they are on the road. It should not be this apparent. Yeah, it shouldn't be this apparent. And then do you attribute any of this to the Miami Dolphins defense? Because I feel like Miami's defense was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's the Dolphins. It's fine. But I feel like over the past few weeks, it has gotten noticeably better. Mm. And then they've played m much more solid defense where it's like, OK, maybe this is a defense that can bend but don't break and then get you some turnovers in a playoff game and then step up versus the Buffalo Bills this time. Yeah, I think the addition of Jalen Ramsey has helped him a lot because he's been playing exceptional since he's come back. And I know he was banged up to start the season. He was able to get acclimated and back in. And now that he's back to full strength and he's fully acclimated again, now you're seeing guys like Bradley Chubb step up. You're seeing guys like Xavier Howard step up. And this defense has the talent here to play really well. And this game, I mean, being able to hold the Cowboys to 20 points, even if it is a team that is on the road, I mean, really, it's kind of like if you can mitigate C.D. Lamb to some extent and really just shut down everybody else, that's been the formula for them. And they shut them down and they won the game. So credit to them. Yeah, and I think with the Dolphins, too, it's like, well, they did beat a winning team. It's like, did you beat a winning team or did you beat a team that's completely like Jekyll and Hyde on the road versus at home? Because the t Cowboys are not a playoff team if you're just going strictly based on their road games. But at home, they're a Super Bowl favorite. So it's like, again, it's like with the Miami Dolphins, it's like, 
have they did they beat a winning team or did they just beat a team that's abysmal on the road? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> one of those games where it's two teams. It kind of went the way I expected, although I did think the Cowboys were going to win. But at the same time, like both of these teams didn't prove anything to me because I don't think both teams played that exceptional at the end of the day. No. Yeah. And like Miami didn't go out there and drop 30. And it's like, well, I want to see that dynamic offense like and I want to see you be able to run the ball against good teams. And that's been my main gripe with the Miami Dolphins. It's like it's great that you can run the ball when you're blowing a team out. But can you actually run the ball when you need to drain the clock here? And I still haven't seen Raheem Mosert be that bell cow. I still haven't seen Devon A. Chain, even though he's had some injuries really step up and then be those running backs that can drain the clock and then Tyreek Hill Jalen Waddle they did their thing in this game but it's like 22 points it's still not dynamic enough versus a playoff team yeah absolutely not that was shipped back to Monday and this was a Christmas special some people watched it some did not first game which is what everyone was banking on which was the Raiders beating the Chiefs 20 to 14 shutting down that Chiefs offense. Uh, I won't even use any vocab there. Um, and then Antonio Pierce getting the win. Um, this is the first team in NFL history to beat a team after not completing a pass after the first quarter. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a stat? That is a stat. Yeah, that's a stat. And like with the Chiefs, like you said, they face the Chiefs offense, but can we call, even call it a Chiefs offense at this point? This is the shell of the <laughs> Chiefs offense. I mean, their number one running back was Patrick Mahomes. Their number one receiver was Rashi Rice, who caught half of his passes. And then after that, we're looking at Richie James and Clyde Edwards Hilaire and Justin Watson. It's like this team, this offense, woof. That's yeah. all I'm gonna say. <laughs> definitely, this is definitely the worst Chiefs team we've we've seen in the Patrick Mahomes era. And the real question for me now is like, are they gonna win a playoff game? Yeah, it's like, are they? I don't think so. It's like, I want to believe Patrick Mahomes can pull some magic out of his you-know-what, but at the same time, it's like Travis Kelsey has not been dynamic enough where we've seen Tom Brady like scrape it together with Julian Edelman and Rob Gronkowski, but Travis Kelsey definitely seems like he's dealing with some injuries there, mm -hmm. and then he hasn't been the same player this season, and then he's talked about retirement, so that's on the back of his mind here, but it's like Rashid Rice not the answer. Patrick Mahomes is clearly frustrated with his receivers at this point. And they just don't have enough money to really bring in an elite receiver. So it's like, I don't know if it's Mahomes contract, them being paying Chris Jones and putting so much money on the defensive side. But do you think they'll have enough money even in the future to retool this offense? Or do you think this is just going to be the reality when Patrick Mahomes is probably going to be making like a quarter of a billion dollars? I think what I trust Patrick Mahomes because I think that he's somebody that I think is willing to take a pay cut to get one of those top guys. I think he's proven that he's chasing Brady, similar to how LeBron is chasing Jordan. Like he knows what it's going to take in order to get there. And I do think I trust him that maybe a couple of years down the line, he signs a contract that's team friendly so that they can go out and get those guys. Because right now, I mean, you have to make a decision on Chris Jones in the offseason. Will Travis Kelsey stay? That'll clear up some cap. And then also, Making some changes. Obviously, Kadarius Tony is going to be out of there. Sky Moore, will he be there? Like, they know that what's holding them back is their receivers. So I feel like they have to somehow, some way, whether it's him, you know, restructuring his contract or whatnot. If they have good receivers, this team is a Super Bowl contender, 100%. They already yeah. are contenders, but they're that Super Bowl favorite with the good receivers around them. Yeah. And it's like with their defense, it's like, how long are they going to hold up? But it's like, I just go back to that Nick Wright take where he's like, yeah, they're going to go undefeated and win the Super Bowl this year when the Chiefs have still not proven that they can win a back-to-back -back Super Bowl. He predicted, I think it was, what, 22-0 and this year? 20-0 and this going year? Going 20-0. and 20-0, and and then they lost the first week, and then I feel like that Isaiah Pacheco clip of him just sitting on the table and then it collapses like it's a WWE bit has pretty much been a really good summary of how it's gone for the Kansas City Chiefs offense. And like even looking at the receivers right now, it's like, how are they scoring points before? And then suddenly it got exposed and then teams realize like, wait a minute, the Chiefs don't have any good players on offense and Travis Kelsey's banged up. Mm -hmm. And besides that, when Isaiah Pacheco is out, it's like, who really do we have to stop? Like, are we going to game plan for Clyde Edwards-Zolaire? No. Are we going to game plan for Rasheed Rice? I mean, like, 
I guess we can shut him down one on one. And most teams, if you have a good corner, should definitely be able to do that. So it's like after that. And then you have Mahomes just forcing the issue and he's running around. And then on top of that, it seems like he's almost missing open receivers at the same time. There are a few clips where he just had guys who are wide open. But the fact that he goes into panic mode running around the pocket so early and he doesn't have any trust in his receiver. So I think that's a recipe for a first round failure. Yeah, I think it's definite, especially with some of these other teams that are getting hot at the right time, whether it be the Ravens or Browns and even the Bills also like I don't think any team that goes in there is going to be overwhelmed by their offense. And as long as they can contain them, I mean, the really the biggest issue for a team that's going to face the Chiefs is how they can score on the defense because the defense yeah. has been what's been keeping them afloat. If they had a defense that w- that we saw like in 2018 when their defense was less than stellar. This team might not even be in the playoffs right now. Yeah, no, if they had a bad defense, they would probably be pretty bad. And if the Broncos like were the team that people thought they were this year, or I don't know, the Chargers were the team that they're supposed to be every single year. And Justin Herbert's supposed to be the Mahomes killer. It's like if they're in a competent division, they probably wouldn't win it this year either because you have six losses. You're in the AFC North. You're the third best team in your division. Mm -hmm. And then you're tied. Um you're lucky that the Jaguars are so bad because we did pick the chiefs to be the four seed this year in our standings. And Mm -hmm. if Trevor Lawrence wasn't banged up and Christian Kirk was still there, you probably would be the four seed and then facing Cleveland in the first round. And I would definitely take the Browns at that point. Oh, for sure. Uh, And then we go to the NFC East, the Eagles break their skid, beating the giants 33, 26. We saw Danny DeVito go down with injury. And then we saw Tyrod Taylor come in. Um, Giants being able to move the ball. They had 100 yards rushing. On the other side, Eagles, Jalen Hurts had a bit of a bounce back game, started to run the football as well. Do you feel confident in the Eagles after this game, or are you still concerned with them? Um, I feel confident that they can win the division because now you're back on top of the Cowboys right now in the standings. Um, You still have the tiebreaker, and then you went out there, you beat the Giants, and the Giants, like, They're not the best team, but they definitely have improved where you can see their defense is legitimately good. Their special teams was able to get a turnover in this game. So it's like I can't fully wrap around my arms around the Eagles like, yes, they're going to go out there and get back to the Super Bowl. However, I do think they're going to be able to win their division. I think they're going to avoid the Tampa Bay uh, game in the first round there and then pass the duty off to the Cowboys. So it's like. Can I wrap my arms around them as a contender? Not quite yet. Need to see them bounce back in the other few games and get some momentum going. But do I think they'll win their division? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I feel confident in them in, t- in them too because unlike the Cowboys, they can win on the road because believe it or not, you do need to do that in the NFL. Um, and I still trust Jalen Hurts more than I trust Dak Prescott. I trust their run game more. Um, I trust A.J. Brown, although I think him and C.D. Lamb have both had very uh, great seasons as well. For me, it's their defense that have been my concern here. I think that if they can restore what they were beginning of the season, then I'll I'll be back on the train. But I, I think they still have some things to prove for me. But good bounce back win. Giants are a pesky team right now. So give credit to them. Yeah, I give credit to the Giants because I feel like it's tough, especially when you're on a team that just gave Daniel Jones $160 million and you ink that contract. Like, if I was a player on the Giants, I would be pretty discouraged as well. I'm like, mm-hmm. you just gave this guy who reminds us all from Walt Jr. from Breaking Bad $160 million. And then mm-hmm. Walt Jr. probably has a better arm than Daniel Jones, even though he can't really walk on his own. <laughs> um, he's basically a PT cruiser and it's like, okay, maybe we can get like the Dodge charger. We get excited about that, but no, we have Daniel Jones. It's like, I would be embarrassed to be on the same roster. And it's just like when Walt jr's mom gave him that PT cruiser. And he's like, no mom, I would rather walk to walk to school because that car is pretty embarrassing. And dad got me a charger. It's like, what are we doing? Like, Mm -hmm. it's just an absolute waste. So with the giants, it's like, as soon as Daniel Jones isn't on the field, Is it a coincidence that everyone on the team is playing with more fire? Is it a coincidence that special teams is suddenly good again? The defense suddenly isn't discouraged. Like, oh, what is this guy going to do when he goes out on the field? Is he going to trip over himself? Is he going to throw the ball to the defense? Or is he just going to go three and out because we can't do anything besides an out route or a slant here? So the Giants, it's like Daniel Jones isn't there. It's like they've been noticeably better. And if I was on that team, I would 
I would have been discouraged too if I was like, why did we give this guy who wasn't good until his fourth year and it's good, like not being absolutely terrible, but still not throwing his stats still, still weren't good. Very, very <laughs> average. And plus, I think Tommy DeVito has definitely given them a spark as well. And I think that like you're going into the off season here, it's going to be a very deep conversation for them, whether yeah. or not they decide to keep Daniel Jones. Cause if you have a guy that can do 99 to 110% more than what Daniel Jones can do. And he costs 1% of his salary. If that, yeah, it's a no brainer at that point. It's just whether or not someone else is going to take on that hefty contract, whether it be like a team like the saints or the Falcons, potentially two teams that could be in the mix. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that anybody's going to get out of that contract, but can they find a way to? Because I know the Giants fans in the comments have told me numerous times how they can get out of it after next year. It's like, okay, well, can they get out of it now? Because yeah. they should have never signed the contract. And also, I'd feel more confident moving forward with Tommy DeVito than with Daniel Jones. Yeah, well, good news is Tommy DeVito is only making like 400 k So that's another good thing and he's fine living with his parents so you're not gonna have to pay him quite yet so that'll make up the difference there and suddenly it's like when you don't have Daniel Jones on the field Brian Dayball can be like look I was right Jalen Hyatt is a good receiver it's just mm -hmm. we have a quarterback who can throw it down the field right now so I think Daniel Jones is definitely gonna move to the bench next year because as soon as he starts to suck again Giants fans are going to chant for Tommy DeVito because not only is he a better player than Daniel Jones, he actually fits the culture of the Giants. Yeah, so much better. He's definitely a much better fit there. But then we move to our final game, which was the Monday night Christmas game, the battle of two Titans, the 49ers and the Ravens. And the Ravens did get the win there, 33 to 19. Brock Purdy, four interceptions, falls out of the MVP race. We see Sam Darnold step in, but big takeaway here, Ravens spent themselves as the top of the league. Thoughts on this game? Yeah, I thought the Ravens came out and they were upset that they weren't favorites in that game. And I think if it's two one seeds and one team's at home, it's like you're obviously going to be the favorites. But the fact that they took it upon themselves to have that chip on their shoulder and then they rose to the occasion to face off against the San Francisco 49ers, it was really impressive to see. Um, with the Ravens, I was concerned about Mark Andrews, but Isaiah likely has been coming into his mm -hmm. own and it's likely that the Ravens offense is going to be really good, um, going into the playoffs here. And that has been the case. And then you had Odell, say flowers stepping up in this game, but Lamar Jackson in this game cemented himself as the MVP. It's like, it's not Dak Prescott. It's not Brock Purdy. And when Cam Newton's talking about guys who can change the game versus guys who are just going to manage the game while well, Lamar Jackson went out there and changed the game and he was making big play after big play. And then the Ravens defense too, absolute monsters. You want oh, to yeah. talk about a San Francisco 49ers who look like they had an unstoppable running game. Well, Roquan Smith and Patrick queen had other ideas. And then just the play where Kyle Hamilton is rushing the passer falls down, gets back up, gets back into the play, and then Marlon Humphrey tips the ball back into the air, and then Kyle Hamilton is able to still stick with the play and get the interception. And it's like, that's the type of play that's going to get you to a Super Bowl. And that I know he went out with this game with a knee injury. Then the Niners were able to move the ball after that. But this Ravens team proved that they can play with anyone in the NFL, especially a team with the San Francisco 49ers who seemed unbeatable. And they were just running through teams week in and week mm -hmm. out. And then with the Niners, they just proved, like, can they beat a team from the Midwest? Can they beat a team from the AFC? Can they win a close game? Or can they win a game where they're not trailing? And they brought up a stat in this game where um, Kyle Shanahan has never won a game um, since 2017 where his team is trailing by eight points or more in the fourth quarter, which I feel like is shocking with how good his offenses are. Yeah. I feel like that's my biggest takeaway. So I have two big takeaways from this. I'll start with the Niners first. The Niners are a great team. Best team in the NFC. They should be favorites to make it for sure. But this is a team that has faced little adversity this year. You're talking about a team that's had the lead, who has been able to bank on Christian McCaffrey, best running back in football, and has been able to, to beat on these teams when they're ahead. But they haven't really been trailing in most of these games. Yeah. So when they have a team like the Ravens, who can force some three and outs can force your team to have to punt and they can score the way they're able to. This is a team 
hasn't faced a lot of adversity. And when you see them face adversity, you see them start to kind of panic. And I've seen that with a couple of other games this year where when they start to fall behind, when they start to fall, you know, maybe this other team is up 7-0, 10-0, whatever it might be, they start to panic. And I've noticed that a couple of times with them. My second takeaway, and this is kind of an exciting one for me, talking about the Ravens and Lamar Jackson, because our biggest question into the season was, are they going to stay healthy with Odell, with Lamar Jackson? And the NFL history is one of those things that is rewritten every single year. And when we look at it now with Lamar Jackson being as good as he's been, as a prime opportunity to become regain himself as the second best quarterback in football behind Patrick Mahomes this year with a chance to make, you know, that second MVP. And if he can make the Super Bowl and win it, potentially going back to that conversation, you want to talk about a guy who can take over a game unlike anybody else, really? It's Lamar Jackson. And I'm happy to see him enter into that MVP race and potentially resubmit himself as the second best quarterback in football yeah and I feel like Lamar is someone who's been disrespected over the past few years too where people are just ready to put Josh Allen over him and it's like okay yeah I get they went head to head against each other in the playoffs but where was Stephon Diggs um, for Lamar Jackson like where was his elite receivers he was throwing to the Mm -hmm. Hollywood Browns of the world so it's like with Lamar it's like he's always been a top five top three quarterback but when he's healthy, it's like you can see him move around the pocket and then he's a lot more chill than someone like Josh Allen is. And then he was absolutely on point in this game. And then he rises to the occasion for big games. He wasn't a turnover machine in this game. He was able to get the ball to the players when he needed it. And then anytime they needed a first down in this game, Lamar Jackson was able to go out there and ice the game. Um, there was a weird play, though, in the first quarter where Lamar tripped over a ref and the ref was backing up. Lamar trips over him in the end zone and then they still call it a safety. Hmm. Like when we trip over a ref and the ref can't get out of the way because he's backing up. Like, first of all, why are you that close to the field of play if you're a ref? And then secondly, why are we giving the 49ers two points if Lamar Jackson trips over a ref? Like that was bizarre to me. Yeah, that was ridiculous. I don't understand how that play happened. Yeah. But then, like, yeah, neither here nor there. But, like, you do have a point with the 49ers where you get into a situation where the game is close and they're not able to, like, run away with it. And then they do kind of panic. It's, like, a lot of screens to Christian McCaffrey. And it's not a lot of trying to push the ball down the field. And then when they did try to, the Ravens were rallying to the football, popping it in the air. But it's, like, we didn't see Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel take off and be dominant. The Ravens were able to tack them, tackle them, and then stop the yards after the catch in this game. So is the forty the formula to beat the 49ers if you're the Lions in the playoffs? Like, hey, just don't get down to them by more than two scores, and then mm-hmm. they're going to start to get uncomfortable in the fourth quarter, and then you're going to have some questions about, like, Kyle Shanahan, why do you have George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Christian McCaffrey, Brandon Ayuk, Ronnie Bell, and you still can't come back in a game where you're down by more than eight points, how are you allowing your quarterback to throw four interceptions in a game like this? Yeah, a lot of questions here. I do think that, you know, the Brock Brock Purdy hate train came soon after, as soon as he started throwing those interceptions. Yeah. Destroying, you know, people saying destroying his MVP conversation. Never thought he really should have been the favorite to begin with, but that's another conversation we've had before. Um but this is a serious question that the 49ers have to address because if they're going to win the Super Bowl, which this is really their year to do it, if they were to do so, with all the questions in the NFC, with how much talent they have, with how much they've kind of put their chips on the table for this year, if this team can't come back from a seven, you know, a touchdown lead yeah. with all the talent that they have on both sides of the ball, this is an absolute choke job if they don't make it to the Super Bowl and potentially win it. This yeah. is going to be looked back as a disappointment. You trade for Chase Young. You obviously pursue Christian McCaffrey last year. You have a chance. Obviously, you had the quarterback situation in the NFC title game, but this is a team that has to win the Super Bowl this year, or it's a massive bust for them. And with all the pressure that they have, if they fall behind and they start to panic, it's going to be a nightmare for this team. Yeah, and then Trent Williams did go out in this game, and then they lost a few more offensive linemen, so they're kind of playing musical chairs on the offensive line this game, and then Brock Purdy, as soon as he was dropping back, was getting hit. Sam Darnold, same thing, was able to move the ball a little bit, but then the Ravens 
uh, started teeing off again. We saw a Jadavian Clowney sighting. And then we always talk about how deep the 49ers are on the defensive line. But their offensive line, I was like, if there is any question with the 49ers, if Trent Williams isn't there and we have a few injuries, then that dynamic run game starts to fall apart with Christian McCaffrey. Then all the motion with Debo Samuel and McCaffrey doesn't mean as much anymore. And then we're not going to have as much time to drop back, set up these screens and let those plays develop without the best offensive line in football. So for me, I was like, if that's going to be the case with the 49ers, then they're definitely not going to win the Super Bowl. And I'd like a team like the Lions or even the Eagles over them because then mm-hmm. they can both rush the passer with the, all the Lions flaws on defense. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, these teams are playing with more tenacity, too. The Niners team, I don't want to compare them to the Cowboys because they're definitely better and they've proven that already. But this is, this is a similar team with, when they face adversity, when they fall behind. They are not the same team, similar to how the Cowboys are on the road compared to home. When the, when the 49ers are adversely, when they fall behind because of how much they've been ahead, also kind of similar to the Dolphins as well with how they've been. It's like when they face adversity, they start to crumble. And I do think part of that falls on Kyle Shanahan, especially yeah. with that stat that you read to me. Yeah, especially with that stat. And then there's a point in this game, too, where he was kind of spazzing out on the sideline where there's like a there's like a play where there's a penalty on the 49ers and they're like oh Kyle Shanahan like took the time out and then he just runs and he starts screaming at the ref he's like what the fuck is wrong with you no I didn't take a time out but he was like kind of like little jittery on the sideline there wasn't the most calm cool collected guy and then we've seen games where he's definitely mismanaged them and then everyone blames Dan Quinn for the Super Bowl, but it's like, who's the offensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl? Why were they passing? Like it was Kyle Shanahan. It's like you had Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman, and you're passing the ball on the sideline to Julio Jones and throwing incompletions when you really didn't need to. You're up 28 to three. All you need, you could have taken a knee every single play and you still would have had a better shot to win the game than throwing it. Yeah. So very, yeah, he's, that's the thing that he's got to erase. If he's got to be somebody who's elevated over someone like Sean McVay, over the minds of some of the other great head coaches in the NFL, he yeah. has to break through this clear coaching error that he's had the last decade or so. Yeah, and it was this I've compared him to Andy Reid before because Andy Reid had gotten to a Super Bowl in Philadelphia, was a perennial appearance in the um, NFC Championship with the Philadelphia Eagles, but it was always Donovan McDab. He had like Alex Smith and then with the Chiefs and then it was Nick Foles and then it was trying to resurrect Michael Vick and then with Kyle Shanahan it's been Jimmy Garoppolo it's been Brock Purdy and then it's been Sam Darnold and then CJ Bethford trying to plug some of these guys in so like yes he's had Matt Ryan in Atlanta but no one thinks Matt Ryan is the top 10 top quarterback of all time but with Andy Reid he gets Patrick Mahomes and as soon as that happens Patrick Mahomes erases all the flaws that he had so with Kyle Shanahan you have to think to yourself like if we can't get a dynamic or elite quarterback maybe it goes the same route it did with Andy Reid where it's like okay we keep banging our heads up against the wall you are one of the better coaches in the league but maybe it's time for a change of scenery not necessarily for the 49ers but for himself where if he wants to go out there it's like I would like Caleb Williams that I could build around and then it can erase some of my clock management issues because I can trust him with the ball in his hands and he's going to be able to make the plays to erase all of the flaws that I know I have as a head coach. Yeah, and I think that's going to take a lot of awareness for him. And it's just whether or not he has that or not. And I'd like to think he does. I do want to see him have that opportunity, but it's going to take a lot of um, self-reflection for him to do that. Yeah. And you can see it, too, with um, Mike McDaniels, because with Mike McDaniels, as soon as the Dolphins aren't blowing a team out, as soon as they're in a close game, as soon as they're playing a good team, you can see they kind of have a similar issue in Mike McDaniels, offensive guru, same type of deal where Sean McVay, you see Zach Taylor. What does he do? Out games the other coach. Uh, mm-hmm. Kevin O'Connell last year. Well, they did. Uh, they were the first team to have a winning record while being outscored last year. They won all of those really close games, which Mm -hmm. comes down to clock management, and they beat some really good teams. So you can even see it with the coaching tree there. Yeah, 100%. But we have been recapped. We have recapped all of the games throughout Week 16. Make sure to check out our next episode while we preview all the games in Week 17 and look forward into the playoff picture.